All right, um, let's fucking go, mate. Uh, so binary heaps. Binary heaps. By by binary heap. Binary heaps. Okay. So, uh, what we're going to do is we're going to try to optimize binary heaps. And if you haven't used a binary heap before, it's really fucking simple. It's one of the first data structures you'll basically ever do if you take a data structures or algorithms course. Effectively, what you do is you make a little tree. And it can vary depending on kind of um, how... Whether it's a, a min heap or a max heap, where minimum, the, the smallest thing is at the top, a max heap, the biggest thing is at the top. But effectively, we're going to just talk about min heaps. And the rule is that the values in the tree must be um, larger than the ones above them. That's a, that's a 2. That's a 2. And we'll put this as a 7. So it's a valid tree as long as all the children are lower, or higher in this case, sorry, uh, are higher in this case than the parents. And so this is a valid binary tree unless I wrote something wrong here. Now basically, these are really nice because that means the smallest thing in the heap is always at the top. So this is always the, the smallest thing, right? Maybe we should just use like an actual piece of software to do this. Yeah, we're gonna do that. <laughs> You can't see the diagram? Yeah, fuck you, chat. Uh, <laughs> bye! Bye! <laughs> bye! <laughs> Let's see, hopefully this updates. I don't know if this will. I don't trust auto-updaters. Yeah, I'm gonna, I'm gonna hazard to say that that did not work, but we're just gonna ignore it. Okay. All right, uh, so we'll use circles here. And basically, as I was saying, a binary heap, hmm. We're gonna make this nice and aligned here. Oh no, we can't make it aligned if we go, ha. Uh, okay, we'll go like this. Uh, basically, I guess these things need to be more spread out so that we can do this. Hmm, that's tough. How do you lay out a binary heap? This is how we're gonna do it. They're gonna they're gonna be touching. It's gonna be weird. Yeah, that looks like shit. Uh that's two more. Two. There we go. Perfect. Alright. So basically, all it is, is the value at the top for a min heap, and we're just going to ignore that max heaps exist. All that matters is that the top value... <laughs> Sick. 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 Good font. Good fucking font. Okay, well that sucks. Um, uh, hopefully this globally applies, but I don't think it does. There we go. Um, all that matters for a binary heap to be valid is that the value at the top or the parent nodes are less than or equal to the children. That's why I put an equal value in here for extra fun, extra difficulty, and we got duplicate eights. So this should be a valid tree. And effectively, um, binary heaps are useful because the top thing is always the smallest values, right? So we know that the, uh, let's not do that, let's just do this. Um, The smallest value is always found at the top. And that is a useful value, uh, useful property for many different situations because it means that you can very quickly and cheaply find the smallest value in a set without keeping it sorted because this 
is basically semi-sorted. So the way that this is actually laid out in memory is typically going to be in an array. You can actually store it in many different ways. It doesn't really matter. Uh, we have one, four, five, six, seven. We're going to delete this one just so we show that it can be unbalanced. Um, but basically, the, the tree is always as um, shallow as it can be, right? It's perfectly balanced in that you won't have like one long leg on that tree. So we just need five, six, seven, one, two, three, four. Four, five, six. Okay, six. So the way this would be stored in memory would be five, six, eight, seven, and nine. Ads are annoying. Yes, they are. Thank you so much for the three months of support. Perfectly balanced. So, basically, when you have a binary heap, um, you can store it in an array very easily. And what you do is you store the, um, you basically, you store the root at the zeroth or the first or whatever index you want. And then the children for that will follow. And then the children for the things below that will follow. Um, basically, it's stored in order, like top to bottom, left to right. Obviously, you can store it in different orders. It doesn't have to specifically be that order. Um, although you have to be consistent with your implementation. But the reason that is really nice is that what I can do is I can take the index of this and I can multiply it by two. And if I take, in this case, zero and I multiply it by two, and then I add one to that, um, I can get to the left node, the left child node. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna define the, the properties that really matter, which is how you actually find the nodes um, this. So we'll say um, left child is index times two plus one, right? And let's think about it. Zero times two is zero plus one, and that is this left child. Uh, we're going to make all these numbers unique, and we did, actually, by removing that one. Oh, we have two fives. Sorry, and that's actually a five, not a one. But we'll make it a one. Problem solved. Okay. So that is how you get the left child, and then the right child is index times two plus two, right? So if we take zero, multiply it by two, add two to that, and then we get this six here, which is this node. Um, and this allows you to traverse that by just doing a very simple uh, mathematical expression. And these can be expressed very, very uh, efficiently, either by using a shift or by using a multiplier that's actually part of like uh, address resolution on something like x86. Um, heap should be one indexed. Oh yeah, because then you can just do that. Uh, so I'm thinking about doing that. And that's actually one of the things that we're going to look at for performance is whether or not we want to one or zero index them. We can just do nothing with the zero index. Um, and that will allow us to potentially shave one more arithmetic expression off of our uh, algorithm, which could theoretically be a speed up, depending on how it gets optimized and depending on the architecture. On x86, it shouldn't matter because you can do this uh, in one move instruction or any address uh, access. Okay, so basically we know that we can traverse this heap by doing this math to go left or right. And let's see how it works for here. So this five, this is index. Uh, let's just do this. Um, yeah, this is kind of kludgy. Uh, I'll just say this is the index. index and yes you can do them one or zero indexed it just changes these formulas quite a, uh, a bit and then the value right so if we are on this node which is one it's this entry here and let's just let's just do this um let's color them in shall we There we go. 
So now you can kind of see all of the, how they're stored in memory. Isn't that cool? Isn't that neat? Isn't that, isn't that fancy? All right. Uh, and then we'll change this to a, a courier new. There we go. Let's make that courier new bold so it's easier to see. And then we can align those. Okay, so we're able to go left or right, and let's just double check it on this one. So this is this node here. Uh, so we take a one, multiply by two, that gives us two, add one to that, and that gets us three. And yep, the third node is this. And the same thing if we just add one more to that, because that's all that does, we get the right node. So this should work universally everywhere in here. So the six, um, six is stored here, two times two is four, plus one is five, and there's the nine, right? And there's no value here. There we go, that's it. If you'd have a one index base thing, then instead of adding one and two, you add zero and add one. It's that fucking simple, it's not hard. Now, we also need to know how to get to the parent, right? We have to know how to get uh, to the parent from here. So let's say we're at one here. We have to, uh, actually this is a better example because the right one is the harder one. So we are at two here. So I think what you do is it's index minus one over two um, if you're using zero indexed. So we'll see. Uh, so parent, I think is index minus one times two. I spaced out, now nothing makes sense. Sucks, dude. Falling behind. All right, uh, and let's just double check that that's correct. Oh, divide by two, yeah. But yeah, I think that's the math. Um, so in this case, one minus one is zero, divided by two is zero. Uh, two minus one is one, divided by two is zero. Um, three minus one is two over two is one. Yup. Okay. And then this one, five minus one is four over two is two. Okay. Basically, that's all that matters. That's all that matters for a binary heap. Cam is partially blocking. Sorry about that. I'm actually set everything up to move the camera to this spot, which I normally do, and then I never moved it. Thank you. But yeah, that is a binary heap. It's, it's that simple. Now that is storing it in a vector, effectively. Now the question is, how do you remove things from this, and how do you add things to it? Because that's all that matters when you're actually working with these data structures. Well, it's relatively simple. Um, I kind of want this to be, yeah, there we go. So basically, if we want to add and remove things from this, is that still readable? That should still be readable, I think. Um, basically, all we need to do is add something to the end of this list. So we're gonna pretend like we want to add a value here, and now we actually want this. Can I have this just like auto-hide or something? Well, that's nice, definitely don't need that. Okay, whatever, this will be fine. So this is the value we want to add. And what we're gonna do is we're just gonna tack it on to the end of the array. At the very end of the array is where we're going to add it. And this is gonna be index six, and we'll just say the value is zero. We're gonna make it as hard as we possibly can. Um, now this is going to cause um, a value to show up here, which is going to be a zero, and this color. Now, unfortunately, this is wrong. This is not valid. The smallest value has to be at the top of the tree. But you can actually restructure this tree by doing log n values. So what we're gonna do is in insert, uh, we're going to append the new value to the end of the array. And in this case, we are storing them as an array, but you do not have to store binary heaps as an array. Append a val new value to the end of the array, and then uh, bubble up the value to fix the tree. Now what we're gonna do is we are going to maintain the structure of the tree by looking at the parent. So we're gonna take this value, so we just inserted it. We know that we inserted it at index number six. We're going to take that six and we're gonna look at the parent. So we're gonna take six, we're gonna subtract one, which is going to give us a five, and then we're gonna divide that by two, and five divided by two is 
two when you truncate. Um, so we look at index two, and we see that there's a six there. And we do a comparison, and we see that is zero less than six? And the answer is yes. So we swap those two values. Right? And that's it. So we did one swap so far, and now we do it again. So we take this index, which is 2, subtract 1. We get the parent node, which is 0. Um, and we check, is 0 less than 1? And the answer is yes. So we then swap 0 and 1. And then these get swapped in memory as well. And there we go. And now that we're at the root, we notice we're at the root element. There's nothing above us. We stop. And that's it. That's how you handle a binary heap. So what that means is that the time complexity, in this case, the uh, worst case, is O log n. And that means that you have to do log n values, or we could just say uh, log, can I do like log sub? Yeah, there you go. That way it's clear. Um, so basically, in, in this situation, we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven values in our heap. And if we take 7, if we do log, and then divide that by log 2, we'll get 2.8, and then we round it up, and we get 3. So the most amount of operations you have to do is 3 in this situation. Or maybe you round that down. I don't... I guess you round it down in this case. Anyways, this is basically giving you um, log n, where n is a compare plus a swap. Right? Now, that is the worst case, because the best case scenario is that you insert something, it is larger than the parent, and you just keep it there. That's it. You have to compare it, so you have to do one comparison, but you just keep it there and you're done, right? So, um, that is why binary heaps are useful. Now, the reason why that's super useful is that we are able to get the smallest value out of a set of numbers, or data, or whatever the fuck it is, or the largest one. Sorry. We're operation... Yeah. I meant it more as like, this is a formula where n, you do log 2 times n things, but yeah, that doesn't make sense. Um, yeah. Anyways, so the reason why this data structure is useful is you can get the smallest or largest value. Um, as long as you have a consistent way of doing that comparison, you can store the smallest, the largest, you can use some complex algorithm to determine what's smaller or larger and store in some really weird shape. Uh, but this is really useful because we can get the next value uh, very cheaply. And uh, removing is basically the exact same thing. In fact, it is. Uh, so what we do is to remove, uh, this is remove minimum, maximum if you're using a max heap. Um, what we're going to do is we are going to swap the root with... Um, Right? Are we going to swap the root with the parent or with the, the the last thing? I think. I don't know. Maybe I'm wrong. I'm just making this up as I go. <laughs> uh, swap the root with the last element and then uh, bubble down the uh, root. Okay. Swap root with the smallest of its children. Of its children, not the last thing. Shit, I don't know how to do heaps. Um, rip. Let's think about it. Let's see if we can uh, derive it ourselves. Um, so this needs to go and needs to get deleted, which means ultimately this will end up being removed, kind of. Um, I... No, it has to be the last thing. It's not the smallest of its children. It has to be the last thing, because otherwise you have a hole in the middle of your uh, heap. Yeah. Yeah, it de yeah, it definitely is. Okay. Okay. I'm not wrong. Woo! Woo! Um, swap root with last elements in array. And then uh, bubble root down. Right? And that's going to be the same thing. So to remove the zero... What we're going to do is we're going to swap the 0 with the 6, right? And that has made it invalid, uh, 0 and 6. Now, this value we're going to delete, right? And we just delete that thing. 
right? We basically swap it with the last thing, we then update the length of the array, which in this case is now 6 instead of 7, but we have to rebalance this. And to rebalance this, um, God, there's like, I guess there's n no one right way to do this. You can, do you have to bubble it down one way or another? Oh, you always bubble down right, don't you? Because if you bubble down left, you all, you end up having it being unbalanced. So you have to bubble down right. Right? I don't know that is a property of binary heaps, but that is what I am seeing here. I can't bubble this down anywhere except this slot. Right? If I bubble down left, 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 this is now unbalanced and there's a hole. So I have to, at least with an array stored binary heap, I have to bubble it down right. Um... And I think in any heap, because you would lose the balance. So that means all you have to do is check with the right child uh, and see if you're less than that uh, or greater than that. And it, we are. So we swap the one and the six. And that means one and six get swapped. And then we check the right node again. Um, I guess... So this is technically balanced. Um, so I guess the, the algorithm has to be you swap down all the way right until you get to the end of the right chain, and then you swap with the left if and only if uh, it's um, greater than that value. So basically, you, you push all the way right, and then at the end, you then check the left child. I, isn't it swap with the smallest of children? Maybe. N um. Oh yeah, that just works. Uh, hmm. Thinking about it. Okay. Um. I'm gonna I'm gonna swap these two. To make it annoying, right? And we're just thinking about it right now. Um, so this one and this five have been swapped. So let's say we swap smallest, right? Then we swap six and one. Sorry, six and one. And then here, I guess it's fine if you just swap smallest. Parent uh, has to be smaller than its children, yes. And in this case, it's already smaller, so it's, it's done. Uh, and this tree is balanced. Um, yeah, I, I guess, is that true? Because swapping right, I think, would be faster. And that's, that's mainly what I'm trying to figure out. If you swap with the ch greater child, it would be the parent of the smaller one. Um... Yeah, I guess since you're doing swaps, you're not actually creating a new value. Um, I do think that is correct. You just swap with the smallest. Is there a faster way to do that, though? Can you always swap to right? Like I was saying, swap to right, is that invalid? Uh, if you had like an eight. You might miss the smallest element. Ah, uh, that, yeah, that's fair. Yeah, 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 yep. Yep, which could be left, yep. Um, yeah, so I guess you have to compare both and then swap with the smallest. Oh, that sucks. That really sucks. Could it become unbalanced? No, just because you're doing swaps, right? Could you always keep the greater value on the right? Um, I don't know. 
No. That would be too hard. Too many comparisons. Like, yes. Uh, in theory, yes. If you, keep the gr if you keep the greater value on the right, then you literally just store almost a sorted array. But yeah. Um... Okay. And then this is um, swap uh, check for smallest child, swap with smallest child. But yeah, that makes sense. You totally have to do that because uh, you could miss the smallest. Oh my god, this formatting fucking sucks. Um... Okay, um, so the complexity of this is, let, let's think about this. Let's actually think about the complexity for this. Best case is a um, one swap plus, uh, we'll just say O, or this is, uh, sorry, one compare plus zero swaps, right? And the worst case is... Um, is it log to, why can't I click that off? Huh. Okay. Uh, log to N. Oh, fuck off. Why can't you click that off? Okay. Um, log to n compare plus and and it's not exactly this. I need to think through what it actually is. Oh, it does swap off. It just isn't visible. Okay. And I don't think that's actually the case. Um, what is this? Is this worst case scenario? No, worst case scenario would be this, right? Inserting into uh, already full. So let's th let's think about let's think about this. Worst case, log to and compare. So we insert a new thing. Let's just say it is a zero. So this is worst case. Oh wow, that is scuffed as fuck now. Um, zero. Okay. So, we would have to do one, two comparisons and two swaps. Is the number of comparisons always equal to the number of swaps? Yes. In the worst case scenario, it is. Um, and then it's, in this case, we have a, is it the n prior or after? Three log divided by two log is 1.58. Uh, so four log, two log. Yeah, it's afterwards. Okay. So where N is the total number of things, and then it is floor that. Right. So that's the worst case performance. Um, okay. Yeah? Yeah, I think, I think that's right. Okay. Then this one is, uh, best case is an O to compare plus zero swaps. Right? And then the worst case is O floor log two um, n. Let me make room. Let me grab this thing. There we go. Okay. Uh, worst case. Floor log two n times two. Compare plus floor 
log sub to n swaps. Is that true? Is that a true fax? Um, so best case is definitely two compares because you insert, a, let's say, a negative one here. Oh, wait, 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 this is one swap. Yeah. Yeah, that sucks. Um, so you do a swap with the end and then you do a comparison. Okay. So then this is this. Floor log to n times two plus one. Uh, oops, sorry. Why is that formatting in such a stupid way? Why does it format differently when it's selected from when I'm actually fucking using it? Uh, plus one, there we go. Is that true? So what's the worst case for this one? Is that completely full? When inserting with an array implementation, you're always uh, just depending at the end, yes. The tree grows with one side getting both its children before, yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yep, perfectly balanced, top down, left to right. Um. Is that true? What's the what's the worst case remove? This, right? Or is it this? Yeah, this is the worst case remove, I think. Yeah, because you swap with this. This is this is worst case. Okay. So you have 4 log 2 4 is 2. We do two comparisons. So let's try it. Let's just say this is balanced. Uh, and let's say this is a 10, and we want to remove this. So we do one swap here, and that has been accounted for with this one swap here. Then we have to do comparisons. Oh, actually, that goes away. It's actually, I think, n minus 1 here. The swap happens unconditionally, but once that swap has happened, the tree is actually smaller. So the worst case would be this, right? Is that correct? Um, and then n minus one swaps. I guess it's uh, log two n minus one. Don't want that to be a subscript. That? Yeah? How you doing in 2021? I'm doing okay. Plus, let's just uh, put that on a new line. Yeah? Yeah? Is that true? Okay. Um, I think this is true. So we have a zero here. So we swap the 11 with the zero. So that is one swap, which is accounted for there. The tree has now been reduced in size before we do anything else. It is now four in length, which is the N, the, pr the, the size prior to removal. I guess in this case, this is the size after. So as long as we just say N is the size after, it doesn't matter, right? Um, where n is size uh, after removal, and then this is uh, where n is size um, after insertion, right? Worst case, if a child had a, 
Uh, if a child is removed on the right but is swapped left. Yeah, uh, you're right. Let's try that. Um... Um... Yeah. Saw five out of six. Yes, I, yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so uh, 11 and zero gets swapped. That was plus one swap. Uh, N is the size after removal. It was five at the start, but it's four after removal. Log two of four is two. So we should do four comparisons. Um, oh, this isn't worst case because we have one less comparison. Um, worst case is actually this. <laughs> nice. Let's just have this be uh, 12, 0. Okay, now we'll do it, <laughs> right? So, uh, 12 and 0 get swapped, that's one swap. Now, the size is 5 log 2 is 2 when floored. Um, and now what we need to do is bubble down. So we do one, two comparisons. We decide that this is where we want to go. So that was two comparisons and one swap. Um, so let's just keep a tally. One swap. We'll just keep tallies. Uh, two compare. And then we just did another swap, right? Now we have to do uh, two more comparisons. Right? Compare with those two. And then we have to do one more swap, uh, which is now a 10 goes to this. Right? And is that correct? Uh, yes, because we had at one, we had six elements, which is five. Log two on both of those is two. Multiply by two comparisons, we had four comparisons. And then for the swaps, we had two swaps uh, plus one additional at the start, so three swaps. So I think that worst case is correct. I can't think of an even worse one. Yeah. Yeah, I, I don't think it can be worse than that. Um, and then are these ones right? We check those. Those look good. Yeah, that's just swapping all the way up. Uh, log two, if you have four, then the worst case is going there. One compare, two compare. Okay. Yeah, I, I think that's correct. Um... Yeah, I think that's good. I can't think of where this is wrong. But it, it's really important to understand exactly how these things work. Huh. Now, unfortunately, I want this optimized where I'm inserting things that happen more recently. Damn. I'm trying to think how I'd structure that. Obviously, I don't think I can do it with an array-based version. And, and this is this is wrong now, right? Index and values and stuff are wrong. Uh, we'll just correct them. Uh, one, two, this is 10, 6, 12, 11. Just in case someone like screen caps or looks at it and gets confused. Okay. Um, hey, Isaac, how's, how is it going? So, <sighs> hmm. I'm trying to think how quickly I can implement this. Like, it's.
I think I can unroll this. I think I can... When I am removing a value... Or sorry, when I'm inserting, but both, but the insert is simpler. When I'm inserting a value... Um... I can parallelize the compares. I can prefetch up nodes, right? I could check, if I'm inserting, I could check like a couple nodes ahead because the, the reads can happen in parallel. And then the swaps are... Um... Can I compare? Do I have to do swaps all the way up? I think I have to. Yeah, I, um, wait. Do I? Yeah, I definitely have to do swaps all the way up. Otherwise, I would just compare all the way up because it's just a bunch of independent reads and then swap with the first one. Uh, hmm, can I, like... I feel like I can do that in some cases, and that's interesting to me, because if I can do that in some cases, then the question is, is it cheaper for me to check whether or not that's valid, and then do it? Hmm. It's fucking tough. It's so tough. Fucking love it. <laughs> it's a really hard problem. Um, so let's say we just inserted that. Alternative uh, to priority queues. If you do pushes and pops and batches... You can use vec, uh, vec deck and uh, sort the value before popping. Yeah, I mean, that's kind of... Uh, I would say that's pretty comparable to an interval tree in terms of, like, data structure. Um... It's not exactly an interval tree. It's like a discrete interval tree. But yeah, you could try and keep the batches to something. But then, I don't know. I, I just, I don't think that really works. Like, because I'm not inserting in batches. Sometimes I am, but usually I'm not. And if I'm not always doing inserts and batches, then it's going to either be incorrect or it's going to be very expensive. Um, Cause eventually you'll have to sort something out of a bucket and then spill it into other buckets, which would avalanche to N worst case. Now, I don't really care if I'm using an algorithm that's n cubed worst case, but in the best case or in the average case, it's like, you know, 0, 0.05 or something like that, like a fixed amount of comparisons based on my very specific insert and removal frequencies and batch sizes and biases towards the front or the end, right? Um, like... It's tough. Like, it's at the point where, like, a vec deck where I'm mainly pushing things to the front, but every once in a while doing that expensive mem copy, it's, it's hard to say. But basically, what I want to do is optimize this. And what I'm trying to figure out is if I can compare all the way up and then swap with the, the first one. Like, if I insert a three here... Can I just compare, compare, and then swap these two? 
And the question, basically the question is, do I have to do intermediary swaps? And I don't know if I have to. Do I have to? What's the, what's the edge case? Like I'm, I'm, pretty I'm pretty comfortable with the fact that I have to. Uh, what's an example of shape? Uh, I, I just need to see that it's impossible. Um, six, seven. No, I mean, that wouldn't swap up. Need to compare if your brother is smaller. So like, if I insert a one, why would I need to compare if my brother is smaller? Like this is a worst case value, right? A one? And I can swap a one and a fi uh, five. Oh, but this this is invalid. Okay, yeah, that makes sense. Yep, 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 yep. Um, so I'm trying to think if it is worth having an optimization where I can do that. Um. Here's what I'm thinking. Here, here's the algorithm that I'm thinking. Compare parents and climb parents. Note the first parent which you are greater than. Or sorry, note the first parent that you are smaller than. And then note the first parent um, that you are greater than. Basically, you have like a bounds, right? Uh, because I think it is theoretically possible, right? If if this is a if this is an eight, this tree is still valid, and in this situation, I can swap, uh, or I can't. Um, sorry. In, I guess it's always gonna be like that. Yeah, by nature, I have to swap all the way. Sorry, I was thinking I could know like where I have to start swapping, but it's at all levels actually. With with the with the one edge case of equal values. Yeah. Um the only edge case is equal values. And that's kind of what I was thinking. Like in this case, I can swap one and eight without doing an intermediary swap. <laughs> right? Ugh, so is that worth keeping track of? Probably not, because I am not really optimizing for a table with dupes. But if you did, if you had a data structure that frequently had duplicates, then I would actually say that was that would probably be a worthwhile optimization. Because you would basically... Um, basically, you store the index and the value of the first thing that you are smaller than. Or sorry, while walking up the tree, you store, I guess, yeah, you need to store the value so you know, and then you, that adds an extra comparison per level, but that's fine, because that's read-only and independent. Yeah, like if this tree, if this tree was just like a bunch of eights, right? If you're optimizing for duplicates, could you just have the node keep the quantity? No. I mean, maybe. You'd have to be able to pick that up. You'd have to traverse for insertion, but you're already traversing for insertion, but you would have to traverse the other side of the tree. Yeah, I so, no. 
But yeah, if there's a lot of dupes in the table, right, something like this would be one, two, three, four, five, six comparisons, which is free because those comparisons can happen in parallel. And since those comparisons can happen in parallel, um, then it's basically free. Those swaps are expensive. Those swaps are dependent loads, or dependent loads and stores, and a dependent comparison on the next one. And it would basically allow you to just swap the eight and the one, and that would be so much faster than brr, swapping it all the way up the tree. It would, it would be like 10, 20x faster, right? So it's a relatively valid optimization, but there is a cost to it. You do have to store the value such that you can see it. You can make dependent loads less dependent if you change the order. Um, can you? I don't think you can. I mean, to be honest, there aren't really any dependent loads. It's just dependent stores. Um, technically, you have dependent loads on ifs, but those will get pipelined and they'll get uh, speculated. So they don't matter. Um, but the stores do matter. And the stores even might get speculated, to be honest, to some, to some level. Um... Honestly, maybe that's why the performance of binary heaps are so bad, is due to speculation. Whoa. I think that's why. Holy shit. That might be huge. Um, which means that if I were to pre-compute how deep I need to swap. Basically, do all of the comparisons first and then do all of the swaps. That would allow the... It means I wouldn't have a... Um, I hopefully wouldn't have as much uh, invalid, invalidated speculative branches. Because if you think about it, in, in this situation, when I do a comparison, let's imagine they're not eights, but all different values. Basically, I do an if statement, and the, com the processor is going to predict whether or not it's going to be true or false. And if the compiler is wrong, we're going to still like walk the entire tree and do all the swaps. And then the processor is going to throw all of that away. We're going to go back to where we were. And then we're going to do it again. And you might end up walking and doing the swaps like eight fucking times. Like, it could literally be... It could... Wow. Like, that's really bad. That's really bad. It speculates recursively. Basically, your processor is going to just run forever until it runs out of internal resources um, speculatively. And that's going to be like in the 50 to 100 load and store range. So your processor will do loads and stores like 50 or 100 in the future and it won't invalidate it until it finds out it's wrong, which is when like a load comes in and the compare happens and it's like, whoa, we did all of this mathematical stuff and loads and stores that we dispatched, but we actually found out that that comparison we did and we assumed that it would be true, it's actually false. And then it deletes all of that state and rewinds, right? So you basically pay a cost uh, for that rewinding. Um, and that is really important to factor into designing this. Didn't realize it could get so deep. Yeah, it can get pretty deep. Um, hey, Ayad. Ayad Nin Nine. <laughs> How's it going? Uh, sorry, not that one. Come on, what the fuck? Oh, because I typed it? There we go. Is 
so basically, uh, this is what your processor is able to speculate on. Your processor can basically speculate. Uh, it's got 180 registers and 168 vector registers. So basically, as long as it can fit the state in 180 registers, you're good. Technically, 180 minus the number of actively used registers. Um, if it can fit it in the uh, reorder buffer, 224 entries. If it can fit it in the store buffer and forwarding for when their store is happening, 56 entries and 72 entries for load buffers. Basically, your processor can do 72 loads, 56 stores, and like 96-ish, or sorry, 224-ish operations using like 180 registers worth of states before it has to give up. Now, in reality, you're going to do a dependent load, you're gonna do a comparison, the processor's going to predict that comparison, and then it's going to go and do things based on its prediction, and then four to eight cycles later, if it's an L1 cache, it will find out the true value to that operation, and based on the true value to the operation, it will likely unwind very soon. But four cycles is enough time to fetch the next thing and clog up your load buffers or fill another entry in your L1 cache. So it definitely can lead to you basically doing the same thing over and over quite a few times. A double swap becomes a three-way rotate. Yeah. Um, or sorry, if you de delay the swap, uh, couldn't you optimize multiple swaps into a single? That's what I'm... I mean... Yes? Like, that. that's kind of what I'm saying. Yeah, yes, yes. Uh, yes, but yeah, your processor can speculate pretty pretty far in the future. Um, in in reality, your processor can actually speculate indefinitely, right? You can if you just do an infinite loop during speculation, your processor will just infinitely speculate, right? Um, it will just literally do that forever. Um, or I guess that's more like a transactional session where you can loop forever but basically if you can do it in a, tr in a transactional uh session then you also can do it in a speculative session but it, a speculative session will be canceled when it finds out it is incorrect right like when a fault happens when it finds out that the uh, preconditions that it was speculating are incorrect so on and so forth which is typically going to be blocked at basically the largest latency load that you can perform, which is, you can probably get in the 20, 30,000 cycle range, right? You can have a 30,000 cycle load uh, that happens on a processor. Actually, you can probably get much longer than that, to be honest. Um, so yeah, you can do crazy things. <laughs> you can do fucking crazy things. Um, 16 months, hell yeah. can't get too caught up on speculation because that's how you find CPU bugs. <laughs> All right. Um, okay, so basically we're going to implement the most bog standard implementation of a binary heap, and then we're going to see how slow and fast we can do operations on it, and then we'll see if we can make it faster. I think the answer is yes. Okay, um, nice. Cargo, new bin, binary heaps, binary heap. Cargo run release. Um, okay, so we'll do a struct binary heap. And what we're gonna do is, um, Is it const generics? Yes. Um, let's 
So what we're gonna do is, you know what? I'm gonna show you guys why I was gonna do that, and then we're we're not gonna do that first. <laughs> Let's go this way. Um, we're just gonna store U32s, right? which is the fastest operation that you can do on x86 uh, is 32-bit values. So we're gonna do um, the uh, underlying data of the binary heap, and then we'll do impl binary heap uh, fn new um, self, and then self data vec new. And we're gonna show you how much faster we can get that. Technically, we can just derive default for that, but yeah. There's reasons. Um, mute self value u32, and then that's it. So this is an insert. So what we're gonna do for an insert is we're gonna push it. So we'll do self.data.pushval. So this is um, push the value to the end of the array. The Ziven, thank you so much for the four months of support. Hell yeah, pog indeed. So how does doing all the compares first help? It's still speculating on the results of those. It's not because we don't take an action. We're basically gonna compare all the way up, and then we won't actually start doing swaps until we've done all of the compares and we've figured out how deep we wanna go. Now yes, technically some speculation can happen there, but we're going to reduce the amount of speculation. We're not going to delete it, we're going to reduce the amount by hopefully pre-calculating how far we have to swap up before doing the swaps. Um, yeah, okay. Push the value to the end of the array. Good, we did it. Now we have to bubble up the value. Uh, and for this, we're just gonna do while, um, I guess, uh, self.data.line. Record the index where we're inserting the value, right? And then we can do a while index is greater than zero, because we want to stop. I don't know if I want to do it that way or if I want to break out of the loop. It's, it's hard to say. I could just do a loop um, here uh, where the value currently is. Let's just say mute on that. And then we'll say if index is zero, then break. Uh, we're at the root. And we'll do it at the start. So the first case, we're just gonna insert. Obviously, it's just gonna hit index is zero and break out. Then the next one, index is one. Then we'll actually hit this code. And what we'll do is parent is equal to the um, index minus one divided by two, so this is get the index of the parents. And then if the self.data parent is larger than the value, then we're going to do standard mem swap, or actually uh, self.data.swap I think exists, parent and index. Um, and then what we'll do is index is equal to parents, right? Um, else break. Is this now correct? If we're at the root, then we get out. So that's for the very first insertion that will handle that. Uh, and if we bubble up all the way to the top, then we get the parent, we take the index, sorry, IDX. Uh, we subtract one from that, we divide it by two. We then read that value. If the parent is greater than the value, then we will swap it because we have a lower value. We're making a min heap. 
Uh, then we swap the parent and the index, and then we set that our new value is currently stored at parent, which it is, because we now swap those two. And that has caused us to go up, and then we'll loop again. Otherwise, if it's uh, less than or equal to, then we're done. It's already in a good shape. And is this correct? I think this is correct. Uh, let me, bh is equal to binary heap new uh, bh inserts. Uh, let's just find one of our examples that was actually correct before we broke it. Um, I'm just fixing this up. I'll bring it on screen if we need to. Um, five, yeah. BH data. So we should insert it. It's at the top. Uh, let's insert it again. Just keep doing this. Um, let's insert a 10. Insert 11. That should be just... Oh, sorry. I replaced that. I was like, where the fuck did the 10 go? I literally deleted it. Uh, 5, 10, 11. And now let's try a 0. 0... 5 and 10 are under that, and then there's a 10 under the 5 on the left. Yeah, that looks good. I don't see any problem with it. This is correct, right? And then let's do a 1. 1 and 11, and then the 10 is under the 1, and the 5 is under the 1 as well, right? So this is the top level, the second level, and then this is the left level of the one. Ten and five are both fine there. Yeah, this is, this is totally fine, right? I don't see any issues with this. Get the index. If we're at the root, then we break. Get the parent. If the parent is greater, uh, we're going to say if the value is less than the parent. I just like this logic more. If it's less than the parent, then swap it with the parent. Update that. You've been trading any GME? I traded some GME. I, I, I got fucked. It's good. It's good. Um, let's see. Uh, pop min. Mute self. Option U32. So this is about as naive as you can get. So we'll just do... Um, um, let's... Oh, if self.data.lin is zero, then return none. Uh, nothing to return. Okay, we have to get that out of the way first. And then we're going to do no diamond hands. I mean, diamond hands eh, don't really work. Is that comparison on 24, right? Yeah. I mean, it, depend it depends if you're doing a min or a max heap, but yeah. That is the crux. Um, okay. So let's just get the let lin is equal to self.data.lin. Just to be explicit about what's happening, even though the compiler will cache that. Uh, then we're going to swap. Um, we're just going to do uh, self.data.swap len minus 1 with zero. We'll say zero with len minus one, right? Swap the last and first elements, correct? And then we'll do self.data dot, I think truncate, whatever the safe version is. Um, shortens, if it's greater than that, it has no effect, okay. So we update the size. Um, oh yeah, I can just pop. Yeah, you're right. Ret. Um, honestly, pop might be slower, but whatever. This is supposed to be the naive slow algorithm, but pop is likely going to be slower here because it has to do, it has to do another bounds check, which we've already performed. 
Um, I mean, technically we can do this. If let sum ret this um, else none. Technically we can map as well. Um, Um, ah, huh? not quite right. This needs to be mute. Let's just say sum is zero, just to see if it builds. Okay. Um, right. So we pop it. That fixes the length. It also checks if it's empty. It does all of those comparisons. And then we have ret in a local variable, which is the last thing. We swap that with the first element, which is actually the minimum value from the tree. And we replace ret in there. And now we want to bubble down ret. Yeah? Um, ah, fuck, dude. Maybe this is going to be expensive. Removals are just hard. Removals are really hard. They're so fucking complex. <sighs> yeah, that's kind of annoying, dude. All right, plus two on that. Dude, this sucks. Removals are so bad. Honestly, it's probably faster to compute those in parallel. Not that it, like, the compiler should be able to figure that one out for us, but it's left index, right index. Wait a minute. Yeah, I guess you always swap with the smallest child. Wait, no, you don't always swap with the smallest child. It's more complex than that. It's a lot more complex than that. Um... Hmm. I mean, I'm not trying to optimize this, but I am trying to be cautious about doing this in a effective manner. Like something that a naive implementation would do. Um, Q 
Can you just swap it with the smallest value? Because you're getting the something at the lowest part of the tree? Hmm. And that's just because the last element is at the at the lowest part of the tree. Ah. Uh... Like you swap with the lowest one, but I, I, you don't always swap with the lowest one. Don't you sometimes have to swap with the largest one? And that's just due to the last value being big? If you swap with larger. Um. Is that a property of just popping the last element? That's so interesting. Like, is it just impossible to have that state where you need to swap with the larger one? I don't I feel like that is possible though, isn't it? I feel like that's definitely possible to swap with the largest one. The largest child. Why am I thinking so stupidly? Um, yeah, so th this is the situation that I'm thinking about, right? So we remove zero, so we swap one with five, right? And we swap one with five. We find that four is the smallest one, so we don't swap it. Or I guess, yeah, we swap those two. I think I'm thinking about two different orderings. And in this situation, it's still valid. Yeah, you just swap with the smallest, isn't it? For some reason, I, I thought, like, if it's in the middle of the two, that you might have to swap with the larger one to make it valid. But that makes no sense. Yeah, okay. It's just that. If left is less than right, then we swap with that. Yeah, we just swap with the smallest. I, I, I was, like, thinking max and min at the same time, I think. Um... Um, and the ret, no, I guess, yeah, this is fucking hard. Like, how do I want to get that value out of data?
Do I just not want to do that swap? until the end I don't know I'm already trying to optimize it I can't fucking not optimize it um left with index and then here if Read those two. If the left is less than the right, then the left is the one that we want to swap with. And then we only want to swap with it if the left value, uh, or in our case, if the if our value, yeah, if the left value is less than our value, then we want to swap it up. And our value is self data index. Oh, I just don't like reading from data again there. Else if uh, write is less than self data index, else break. Right? I think, like, that's I, the algo, I think. Um, not right. Forty-nine. Assign the index. Yeah, you're right. You right. Um. This should be left greater than right. I don't think so. And this should be right. Left, left, right, right. Um, line 50. Should it ask for left greater than right? That's... Oh, it was implied before, but now it's not due to this. Yeah. It, w it was implied, and then it wasn't. That I was going to do nested ifs in my head. Left and right... Yeah, this is really expensive, man. This is so fucking expensive. This is fucking disgusting. If the left is the smaller one and left is less than the data, then we want to swap those and update. Alternatively, you can small store the smallest child index in a variable. It's kind of hard. I'm trying to think if it's cheaper or not. But yeah, that did cross my mind. Yeah, I mean, that makes sense. Like, the code isn't hard, but the complexity is potentially hard. Um... The way Rust does it is actually really bad. So, if you were to just do, like, small e is equal to uh, if left less than right... Uh, left eye, else right eye, right? This is like the naive way of doing that. This is actually a, like two instructions conditional move. And conditional moves do not get speculated on x86, so it's actually a really good property. Um, the one they're doing, like... The one they're doing does not optimize well on x86. So you basically have to XOR a register. You have to then do a set less than or equal to. Um, and we can do equal. It doesn't matter. Um, 
yeah, left eye plus less mi left minus right as u size. But how do you how do you write? That's an expensive expression on x eighty six, right? You're gonna have to basically do a set cc, and then you're gonna have to uh, sign ex uh, you're gonna have to extend that, which is expensive because set cc only works on an eight bit value, right? So if we just said um, pub fn, it's not an expensive expression. I think it is. Uh, lefty, righty, um, left, right. Uh, we'll just have this return a uh, u size, right? So we're gonna say uh, left i plus left minus right as u size. Oh, I guess they do an add with carry. Yeah, but they do a compare. Compare add with carry. Okay. I don't know. I'm kind of skeptical. Um, I wasn't thinking add with carry, but that makes sense. You're able to do an add with carry there. If you could not do an add with carry, it would be much worse. But you can get a, you can cheese away an add with carry. If add with carry did not exist, the section function doesn't know if right eye is equal to left eye plus one. Yeah, that's fair, but that's totally fine, right? Right. Basically, if if ADC didn't exist, if add with carry didn't exist on x86, then this would have to be a move, compare, conditional move to set a zero or a one, or an XOR to clear register, then a set uh, L to set less than, and then an add, and then a ret, right? It's literally only better because add with carry exists. If this instruction did not exist, this would be worse than this. And for other architectures, like an architecture, let's see, like MIPS maybe, that doesn't have uh, uh, flags. Like, other ways to make a ternary operator work in assembly without conditional move? Um, yeah, but they're going to be much more expensive, <laughs> right? A conditional move is very cheap and relatively common for architectures. Um, let's see what we can find here. Let's try this. Yeah, here we go. Here we go. Right? I guess they're using a branch there. That's fucking gross. Oh, that's due to the calling convention. Ah, there's set less than unsigned. And that one works because uh, set less than is a, a one or a zero. Okay, that makes sense. That makes sense. Arm will have flags, so arm will be fine. We can just do Android, it doesn't matter. Um. I guess most architectures have something like that. Hmm. Set less than unsigned. Yeah. So on x86, this, there, there is no equivalent of set less than. Um, right. You can only you can only set flags in a comparison, and then you can do a like. Um, set cc but set cc only works on 8 bit and that this is what this is what i thought x86 would emit but obviously since it has a carry flag it actually works um yeah let's actually try this i'm just curious oops yeah here we go that's x86 and then we can do if left is um yeah 
Let's try this just for fun. Subtract with borrow. Yep, that makes sense. Um, yeah, but set CC only works on an 8 bit value, right? And that's what I've been saying. Set CC exists, but it only works on an 8 bit value. And if it only works on an 8 bit value, then you're not able to add a 64-bit uh, size with an 8-bit value unless you zero out the register prior to actually doing set CC, which is uh, dependent and uh, another instruction. Um, trying to think how I can coerce it here, but I, I don't think I can really do any comparison here. See what this does. Yeah, here we go. This, basically, this is what I'm saying. If you did not have an add with carry, look at the difference. This is exactly what I'm talking about. This uses the ternary operator, but it's more instructions and more expensive. And that is because it has to zero out the entire register prior to doing set equal, right? This is basically what I was thinking, and I wasn't thinking ADC exists, but since ADC exists, is actually pretty good. But yeah, in this situation, if equality was the operator, then this one, the second example, is actually better and faster, right? That's the point. <laughs> That's the point. Literally, if add with carry did not exist, this one is worse. And we simulate that, yeah. Um, but yeah, most architectures don't have a set instruction that only sets the bottom eight bits because that's fucking moronic. Um, so like MIPS and x86 all, uh, or MIPS and RISC and ARM all have one that, that does that. So if we do target this, right, these will be identical on both. Actually, this one actually emits a branch, uh, which I guess makes sense. Yeah, that's interesting. That's actually really cool, I like that. But yeah, this is technically better due to add with carry and then ARM and RISC-V and MIPS, it's, it's better as well. What about like PPC and Spark? I'm just curious how many architectures um, have that property. I guess it's really just an issue. Uh, x86 just doesn't have a good set operator. No Spark? What about S390? Yeah, look at it for S390. Same sort of shit, right? 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 The if statement's better on that one. Like, I typically think that architectures have better supports for, um, I typically think that architectures typically, like risk architectures, typically are better with conditional moves because they're typically a little bit more expensive for comparison. So they're more conditional move heavy. heavy. There's a great example of where the conditional move is easier than having the actual arithmetic because this arithmetic, basically the reason for this is the second one doesn't have to create a value, right? This does not actually create a value or do math. It does a comparison and then picks from one of two existing values. This one actually has to do a comparison and then create a new value that is either zero or one based on that condition. And if an architecture doesn't have support for like a set conditional, then you're going to have issues. And we see that here in S390, right? And it's just gonna, it's get, and it's gonna be effectively random by architecture, but I think this is a great example, right? Um, I have no idea why that did that twice. Oh, I selected wrong. I'm just curious how many architectures that it holds true for. Uh, they're not gonna have that, are they? Uh, PPC unknown Linux, please. You'd have this, right? Yeah, look at this one. Look at it on PPC. Look at that. Look at this and look at this. 
Fuck off! <laughs> yeah, dude! <laughs> I'm pretty sure LVM would compile the conditional. Yeah, let's do this. Yeah, I, I agree because it is happening in the same function. Come on, LVM, what can you do, baby? What you got? Oh, what? It broke both of them! Not like this, LVM, you failed me. I think it's because it actually has to do the uh, arithmetic inside the function, right? I think that's why it's getting fucky, is because now it actually has to do the arithmetic. Also, this disassembler is, is not working. This disassembler is not fucking working. <laughs> <laughs> it's it, like this is a register uh this is a constant oh god it's not good um yikes Ooh, oh, IT blocks. Fucking IT, dude. We're gonna go back to this for funsies. Yeah, I don't think, uh, I don't think it's smart enough to know that. Okay, those ones are good. That makes sense, because you have ITs. Oh, let, oh, we got, we gotta check this one out. Ooh, ooh. Oh, they have a ternary operator. But this one wins. It does a less than get zero, which I'm guessing is getting the result. And then add. So it's basically a stack based thing. Makes sense. So I get these two values less than get the result of the comparison add that to the first thing, an n function, and in this case it gets all of them, does the comparison, less, left minus right, and then does a selection using this as the condition. That's actually pretty nifty. <laughs> That's pretty fucking cool. Oh man. Dude, that's fucking dank. Uh, let's check arm 64. Okay, there's a... Wow, is that a... The fuck is that? Is that a carry increment? Increment by carry? Conditional in... Oh, it's a conditional increment. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, conditional increment uh, if it's lower. Yeah. Okay. That makes sense. That makes sense. And then this one actually does a ternary. Sick. Dude, these are fun, dude. These are super fun. Boop. AVR. Aw, oh, fucking rip, dude. NVIDIA. Let's see how well we can uh, ship this out to a GPU. Oh. Same amount of operations, and almost exactly the same operations. The only difference are these two. So this one does a select. Oh, wait. This one selects between a one and a zero, and then adds that um, to create the new value. This one does an actual select between the values. Oh, that's kind of cool. That's kind of cool. How does one obtain all his knowledge? Um, how do you get interested in this stuff uh, when you start your career? I just, I don't know. Probably have some, 
have some screws loose in your head that make this really fucking interesting for some reason. Spark V9? Ooh, get fucked on Spark V9! Oh my god, is that a delay slot? <laughs> it has delay slots! <laughs> oh yeah, get fucked, Desu! How's your algorithm looking now? <laughs> Not gonna look too good on Spark now, are you? <laughs> I got wrecked. <laughs> Desu! <laughs> oh no. No, I don't know. Like, the stuff is just really interesting to me. Like, that initial thing that I had that's like the comparison is probably cheaper than the arithmetic stems from this. It stems from the fact I've worked with a bunch of architectures, and I know some architectures don't have a set conditional, which means they don't have a good way of sourcing a zero or a one, or something like x86 has a set conditional, but it only works on 8-bit, so you need to zero out the register prior to using set conditional. And then some architectures have a ternary operator, and some have conditional uh, compares and conditional moves. Uh, well, they all have conditional compares. Conditional moves. And that's where it's like really interesting, like... I'm happy with this because my intuition, while incorrect for x86, there was a grain of truth to it. And I think this is, this is like really interesting to me that this has happened. But yeah, if you want to get knowledge like this, you really just have to, you have to just work on a lot of projects. A lot of this stuff is time, right? Keep in mind, I probably have written code 80 hours a week for the past 15 years of my life, right? Like, I have the amount of programming experience that most people don't get until they're in their 40s. Um, and that's just because I do it so much. I do it so fucking much. Like, why are we doing this? Why do we have Godbolt open and we're looking at the assembly output for Spark? Well, it's because we want to figure out the fastest way to write a, um, we want to figure out the fastest way to write a binary heap. Well, why do we want to figure out the fastest way to write a binary heap? Well, we want to be able to have a list of, like, things that are happening in the future, and we want to get the one that's most recent to occur, so the, or the thing that's going to happen next. So we need a way of sorting things. And why do we want to do that? Because I want to theory craft my fucking World of Warcraft character's healing output. And until you can be in Godbolt, looking at Spark Assembly, trying to figure out a micro-optimization to a binary heap structure, because it makes you heal better in a fucking video game that came out 15 years ago, it's really hard to get this knowledge. Because literally, I program and study and learn shit for things that people do not bother programming for. Basically, I turn every fucking hobby I have into a programming project. A lot of people don't do that. <laughs> a lot of people don't do that. So if, you're, if you really want to get the knowledge and experience I have, then you have to have some fucked thing going on in your head that makes you think this is a valid thing to be doing at 1 a.m. in the morning on a fucking Sunday night because you want to heal 2% better on your fucking video game that's dead as hell that doesn't even matter how well you heal. <laughs> but seriously, like, that's what it takes. If, if you're actually curious what it takes to get this level of deep knowledge, it requires that you can turn everything into a relatively sophisticated programming project. And that is not a very natural desire for most people. <laughs> like, it's just... I don't know if that makes sense. I don't know if that really under, like, underlines the absurdity of, like why I am learning about binary heaps right now. Like, I'm not doing this for work. I'm not doing this for anything that would make me money or do anything. I am doing this for fun. <laughs> and like, 
I also have an end goal. I'm not studying to get a job or interview better or impress someone or preemptively figuring out a data structure. This is literally the bottleneck in my theory crafting right now is this. To this level, to the extent that I care about the shape of the assembly, is the level that I need to improve before I can make my theory crafting better. Like, <laughs> only number three US priest? Hell yeah! Get, get, getting number one's gonna be fucking hard. Number one US priest is actually number one world priest. Uh, no. They're number one. Yeah, they're number one world horde priest. Yeah. Does a sorted vector represent a valid binary heap? Yes. It has to, right? Because it's impossible for something to be descendant in the tree that's earlier in the vector, and thus it has to be valid. <laughs> then we found the best solution. I mean, that's what I use right now as a sorted vector. I do binary insertions into a sorted vector until len is less than 40. The problem is len less than 40 is not the issue. It's the implementation that matters. And that's what we're going to theorycraft. Fear it back. All right. Um, 90% of the stream is going over my head, but I like the Moses passionate and thus enjoy the stream. Thank you so much. I'm glad you enjoy it. We are here for the passion. What do I, do I need to tighten? Bear, I'm so sick of that floating away from me. Let's see. Let's see if we can stop the floating by just tightening a screw and see if it just makes it stiffer. It's not that much stiffer. Sorry if this is making loud noises. Oh, it's not floating away anymore. Ah, wait. Ah. 
Honestly, I just can't get enough torque on the screwdriver. I thought it wasn't going to be super torquey, but I use my small screwdriver. That's all right. I think it is improved. It's just not perfect. Just not perfect. Okay. Oh yeah, someone was talking about SimCraft. Have you looked at SimCraft? I have not looked at Simulation Craft uh, source code before. The performance is not necessarily what I'm looking for, to be honest. It's too thorough. I don't know. It's also DPS uh, theory crafting. <laughs> Wait, so we actually settle for not perfect. I, it's an improvement, right? It's an improvement. Um... So, how do I want to do this, then? Um... Hmm... Thoughts? I don't know the data. Um... No. We don't know what value we're bubbling. Um <clears throat> Okay, I'm I'm going to I'm going to show y'all some stuff. Um okay. So this is kind of a naive implementation. Um, let's get an RNG. Okay. Um, Um, ran random. That's what I want. Yeah, we'll do seated. We'll we'll do it seated. are very random values. Oh, those are the most random values I've seen in my life, dude. Uh, 
Um, them's lottery values. Oh, yeah. What do I want to do here? Insert a and then drain it. Is that going to get optimized out? Shit. Oh, yeah, I forgot about that. Um, I thought it in my head, but then I forgot it. Um, dude, there is not a good way to do this. I feel like we can definitely outperform Rust's version. <clears throat> I'm guessing they do gets from an array. Hmm. Good morning, evening, or whatever. How's it going? <clears throat> There's got to be a good way to do this, right? Um... I'm trying not to optimize this. <clears throat> Obviously, this is crashing here. <clears throat> Technically, on right eye, but that's fine. Um, we'll just do it naive first. Oops. Um, I don't know how ordering works on options, to be honest. Um... None is less than some. Okay. <clears throat> um. Is that why Rust does a max heap? Is that why their uh, their version is a max heap and not a min heap? Because for a min heap, you can't use uh, the comparisons, <clears throat> or they're like a little messier, I should say. Because I do find it weird that Rust uses a max heap. I feel like max heaps are not the standard implementation. Like, I feel like nun heaps are more prevalent. Obviously, there's no right or wrong, but min heaps seem to be the more common impl. Um... Yeah, how do I want to write this? I'm always reversed in the heap. Using reverse in the heap. Yeah, yeah. Um. Can you make the heap implement uh, generic over the comparison result? Yeah, that's what Rust does. It's just annoying.
Dude, I can make this so much faster than Rust's. Like, there are some really cool optimizations I can do. It's not quite what Rust does. I mean, Rust uses the comparison, the, the ordering implementation on the object that you're inserting, which you can custom write, which gives you control over it. But it may affect the ordering that is used in other things. Like, you might not want to overwrite uh, ordering globally. You might want to just only specify custom ordering specifically for the heap, but then store it in like a sorted vector that's sorted in a different way. Um, so it's not great, to be honest. So if let if left we can just do this, right? No, because if that's none, that would not be true. Oh yeah, this is gross, dude. This logic fucking sucks due to that uh, option comparison. Dude, that fucking, oh, that's so stupid. Dude, that's so bad. What the fuck? Dude, we're going to be able to crush the performance Rust has. All right. Um, Probably a better way to do this, but whatever. We're just getting this done. Uh, that won't happen. If the right is none, then it's left. Otherwise, in all other cases, then it is if left is less than right. Right? So if they're both none, if there's nothing below us, then we can't bubble. Um, right? Um, it's not quite complete yet. And then we only do the uh, swap if self data index is less than small i. Can I hire you to ha hack into the Pentagon? Are you talking about the hack the Pentagon program by DDS? Um. This should be correct, I think. Thank you. Um, if the value is less than that, well, we're at the top. It's actually the other way. 
if the smaller value is less than the data, then we want to move it up. Expected U size from U32. Ha! <laughs> Rip. Sick! Uh, expected U32. Oh, because it's a get. Um... Is that right? Copied on get, yeah, I'll just deref it, I don't care. Oh, here. It's hard to say which one's better. I, I would hope copied would have better perf, but it's hard to say, actually. Um, so we get the last thing, we swap it with the first thing. We're gonna return ret, okay. Then we have index is zero, you get the left and the right indices. We get the values for those things. If neither of them are present, then there's nothing else to do, and we break out of the loop and we return the ret. Um, if right is none, then the left is the one that needs to be populated. Otherwise, both of them are present, because it's basically either both are missing, or the left is, um, or the right is missing. It's impossible for... Uh, it's impossible for only the left to, to be present due to the way that it's filled in. So we don't have another else if there. We simply just compare if left is less than right, then left is the smaller value. Otherwise, right is the larger value. Then if the value, if the smallest value below us is less than our value, then we need to move ourselves to that smallest value and we do. Would you be interested in optimization to this? No, because we're not optimizing it right now. This is meant to be like what, I, I'm role playing as a shitty developer who's learning Rust for the first time and never written one of these data structures and we're just implementing it out. Because we're not gonna do any of this shit in our optimized version. A lot of this shit's going away. So, um, is it really that slow? It can't be. It's broken, it just doesn't work. Why does it not work? Why does it not work? Do we get there? Yes. This loops forever. And I kind of disagree with that. There should only be 100 values. Oh, it gets... Oh, um, else break. Um, if it's less, and then this is, um, we reach the end of where we need to propagate. Right? Aww. 82. Uh, if self.data.lin is zero, Return some ret. Okay. All right. <clears throat> that seemed fair. We need to make sure this is not getting optimized out. Um, because it might be getting optimized out because BH is not used again. Although there are panics that can occur deep in here, and if panics can occur deep, then in theory that needs to be checked. So, we'll see what we can do. Um, I really wish you could use scientific notation um, uh, for non-floats. Like, obviously, I can just cast it, and I can say, like, as U size or U32 or whatever, but... Kind of sucks. Okay, and then what we're gonna do is for um, size in zero to 100. Uh, yeah, let's do for size in one 
to 100, binary heap here, uh, bh.clear, bh.data.clear. Uh, it's gonna mean we don't reallocate things. Um, and then let's just make this with capacity uh, 1024, right? Nah, 1024. So we basically pre-allocate that, so we make sure that we're not actually benchmarking that aspect. Um, okay, and then here, for each of those sizes, then we're gonna do a print this, uh, we'll just do 10 and 10, and this will be the size and Um, clear is basically free. Yeah, clear is free enough. Um, okay. Uh, oops. Uh, elapsed over. I guess we want. What do we want to do here? Um, time, time per uh, like iter, kind of. Fuck. Um. Okay, much better. So this will now be cycles per, it's the same value that we saw before, uh, 10.3. Uh, actually like 10.6 is probably fine here. So this is the number of entries in the the number of entries that we insert into our binary heap. Okay, so let's cut this down. Let's go to 1,000. Yes. Okay, and then we'll bop this up to, we'll just say this is, uh, let's just say it's a, million entries, which means we can then go a little deeper in this. There we go. So this is effectively going to show us the scaling properties, uh, which is basically the cost per entry. I don't like that formatting. I want to give it a couple more sig figs or more spaces, I guess. I don't like when my numbers get too squished. I like having very distinct columns. Okay. Um, uh -huh, did I fuck something up? Am I wrong? Reminds me of some data formats in physics. Oh, okay. Whew. I thought my implementation was wrong. Have you double checked it? Like, are you confident that's correct? I mean, I can literally compare it to the results of another one and write a test, but... Um... um What do you mean graph time? We're not gonna make a graph. Okay, so we made a graph. Um, sick. 
Didn't I say with line? Oh, you want to with line. Uh, beautiful. That's fucking log. Mm, set grid x ticks y ticks m x ticks m y ticks. I didn't do log log. Log log's actually not correct here. Uh, let me switch the size. We'll just say 900 by 900. What a great resolution. Yeah, so, okay. There's no fucking way that the Rust one is outperforming this. They call there's a binary heap, don't they? Ah, uh, and they do a max heap, not a min heap. Fuck! That's a good parse. Hell yeah, dude. Let me, um... Okay, so we're gonna make them basically comparable in that regard. Sick. And then we'll do uh, let rng is equal to rng.clone. Um, Our perf is equal to elapsed by 1,000 divided by size. It's the same as this. Okay, our perf. And we're just going to dupe the code. Um... Are people's binary heap. Ah, oh, fuck. Uh, hopefully I can clear it. Thank fuck. Uh, what do I have? Push? And then pop. Now, these aren't identical yet. 160. Cannot borrow is mutable. Good. That was intentional, so that I would make sure that I actually use that vari variable. And then this is uh, rust perf. Okay, let's make a max heap. Um, how do I make this a max heap? That. That. And that, is that it? Just those three? I feel uncomfortable with that, but uh, if the value is greater than the parent, is this, is this right? This one and this one. Okay, so now this is apples to apples comparison. We copy the RNG, they both allocate the same amount of space, they both get a thousand iters to let the caches warm up and all of that shit. These are apples to apples comparisons. <sighs> now name min, but it does max unreadable. <laughs> What the fuck off? <laughs> Dude, like, come on. This 
This is as, this is disgusting. This is about as unoptimized as you can make it. Fuck off. Mom. <laughs> what the fuck is that? Look at that scaling. Fuck off. <laughs> like, could we really make this more naive and shitty? We don't cache things, we fetch things from memory multiple times, we like... <sighs> what the fuck are you doing? Oh my Lanta Jesus Christ I'm just gonna print the uh this is gonna be the slowdown factor. Ignore the labels. Slowdown factor. It's 30% slower! Fuck off! And it's it's like 10% slower even when N is fucking tiny! We're gonna up some of these itters. Uh, unacceptable rust. Oh my god. What? Oh. <laughs> Woo! Woo! Um, we can go more iters. I'm just trying to smooth out the graph more. Get us a little bit better data. Technically, I could do this in threads and stuff. But I'm trying to smooth out the data, make it so it's easier to see what's going on. Definitely don't need that many sig figs, but whatever. Um, it's slower across the board. Uh, new to stream, anyone know what's going on? Uh, I'm working on a World of Warcraft theory crafting tool, and right now we're working on optimizing a binary heap implementation. Anyone clip the mom reaction? <laughs> oh my god. Mom? Can you optimize my backstabs? Just get good, kid. Get some fucking gear. Hee <laughs> <laughs> Get fucking wrecked. <laughs> Woohoo! Oh man. My feelers. Dude, that's bad, man. Twitch man, this guy's a bully. Ah. Shit, dude. Rust heaps look slower, not optimized. I don't know how. I didn't even optimize this. <laughs> it's shit. This is the worst fucking implementation of a binary heap since binary went to heap school. Dude, like this is trash. Look at this trash. Look, look how many times we double fetch. You ready for this? Look at this. Look at this, we, we fetch the parent, and then we swap with the parent. So we end up like using that value twice, and we don't have to. Down here, we're getting things, we're doing two bounds checks, two independent bounds checks of the rate. Now maybe, maybe the compiler optimizes that out and does some good stuff. Then we do a fucking, like, five deep conditional statement 
determining which one, whether we're at the end. Oh, my Atlanta. And then we do our double fetch here. <laughs> this guy looks like a fang interview to me. Yeah, exactly. Trying to release. We're already in release, baby. This is release. Oh, you want oh you want the zoomies? Oh, we'll give you the zoomies, dude. Nope. <laughs> nope. <laughs> what the fuck? <laughs> they didn't have the time to answer the follow-up question. Re. <laughs> Re. I, I, I fail Fang interviews. I'm all about failing Fang interviews. F fang interviews do not suit me well. <laughs> um, f oh, this is gonna be called Binary Heap Fast. Y'all ready for Binary Heap Fast to come in here? Is it gonna be f FBH uh, Fast? And this is gonna be RNG Fast? And then we're gonna go down here, and we're just gonna copy paste all this. And then we're gonna say fast perf. And then RBH, uh, what do we call it? RB, FBH, fast binary heap. Fast, fast, pop min, insert. Um. Data.clear. Let's just make sure we copied everything. I think we did. Fast perf. All right, there we go. We should, uh, should be good. Oh, it's not. That is why I like warnings. All right, so hopefully, hopefully the fast one is, is the same perf as ours because it's the same code, but it is a good check sometimes to double check that you are getting the same uh, results and that you have deterministic performance. And it looks like we don't? Nope, that's one three. Okay, one four. Whew. Okay, yeah. So, ours and fast are basically the same. Um, and then Rust is, is doing its thing. Okay. So, what we're gonna do is, we're gonna do some optimizations. So insert, what can we optimize here? We could potentially reduce the complexity of this by using a one indexed. Y'all wanna see what one indexed looks like? Um, that's kind of hard, actually. I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't know. I don't know if one index is is better here. Um, push the value at the end of the array. Good. Uh, can I make a box slice yet in Rust? Uh, rust box. I guess I can make the vector. Yeah, new zero, new on init. Yeah, not a good way. Um, Uh, 
Um, into box slice. Oh, I want to make a boxed array though. New zeroed. Maybe on an it zeroed. Let's do that. Okay. So we'll just do box slice is not the same as a boxed array because it has a dynamic length. Is box syntax still a thing? Did they get rid of box syntax? Oh, it's, it's still experimental. And I think that makes a slice. I don't know if that actually makes a... I don't know if the box slice... Um, Why don't you use what Suvu uh, suggested? Because it allocates uh, uh, four megs on the stack and it doesn't scale. It requires that you create the value on the stack and then you move it. It's stupid. I'm not saying his suggestion is stupid. I'm saying that the fact that Rust doesn't have a way of uh, lazily initializ initializing uh, boxed uh, arrays is stupid. Yeah, there's really not a good way to do this. Fucking stupid, dude. Obviously that is a bleeding edge feature, but that's fine. You, you can do it in a couple ways. You can do transmutes, but you're gonna have to do on safe. Um, okay, so that is now made into a thing. Oh, I wanted these commented out. Whoops. Didn't want to undo that far. Oh, well, not a big deal. Not too much time is lost. Do, 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 do. Alchemy. <laughs> Box assuming it. Oh. How does that work? Wait, how, how, wait, that. Oh, you're saying I have to, yeah, 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 do it on that. No, I, I agree with that, 261. Uh, let's just get rid of that temporarily. Okay. Okay, uh, assuming it. Oh, look at our perf. Our perf's really good when we do nothing. Oh, so this is actually really good to look at. Um, so chat. 
why do we care that this number is really small? Why do we care that this number is very, very, very small? Why is, it, why is that important to us? It's a, it's, a, it's a challenge for chat. And we haven't talked about it at all. You just have to use your common sense to try to figure out why that's important. Doing nothing is perf. That's close, but not exactly. Why is it, why is it not zero exactly? No overhead from testing. You fucking nailed it. Yeah, exactly. That's effectively... Since we're doing effectively nothing, this is basically telling us the, the cost, basically the noise that's introduced by our measurement itself, right? And if this number was fucking 50, then these measurements mean nothing because there's so much noise. But given this is such a tiny number, it means that this is not really affecting this value, right? It means that we're not measuring our measurement, uh, we're actually measure, measuring the underlying thing. Now, that being said, these loops probably got deleted. Um, since these loops got optimized out, technically these loops might have a cost. This clear might have a cost and things like that. But Okay. So now we're going to try and make this fast. Um, basically empty it. You know what? My strategy is not... I had a dank optimization strategy and it, it doesn't work. No, it works. Wait. Um. Yeah, I've got, I have a dank idea. We're we gonna get this working first, just using the box. So it's gonna be the same thing. Dude, I've got such a cool idea. Too dank, too furious. Yeah, this is, this is gonna be intense. Is that done? Yeah, that's it. <laughs> uh, oh, we gotta update the index. Get the old index, update the index, store the value at the end of the array. If we're at the root, break. Otherwise, get the parents. If the value is greater than the parents, um, then swap it with the parents. Index is parent. Okay. So. Ah, okay, so obviously there, there's a cost that's starting to happen. Makes fucking sense. Now, what we're going to do is let's index. Um, we're going to say if self.in use is greater than zero. Um, obviously, if in use is zero, then there's nothing. Then we're going to swap the last thing in the array with the first. All right, bink, bink, swapping those two things. Um, let's, let's just try this, okay. Go through and then we get these. 
just gonna read them. Um. Special case in use is one. Yeah. I'm going to say this. Right? Um, and then these. Um, If the index is greater than or equal to the length, uh, what is it? Then some? Is it then some? The fuck is it? Uh. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um. Oh, sorry. If it's yeah, I didn't know which way I wanted to go yet. Um, right eye. So this has basically the same logic. Can we get a can we get a pog in chat for bool to option? Don't swap. We're not optimizing that level yet. I want to get a baseline. Basically, I'm translating it, and then we're gonna optimize it once it works. I don't want to do two steps at at one go. Pog for bool. <laughs> yeah. Isn't that fucking cool? Right. This basically has the same effect. Now, technically, this is going to read out of bounds, but whatever. <laughs> it's fine. It's fine. You'll see why it's fine shortly. Um, ret not found. Yeah, okay. So we know that there are at least two things in here. We swap. Um, self in use. This should be minus one. Right? We subtract one. We then swap with, we swap zero with the last thing. Yeah, that's actually right, isn't it? So, remove the thing, this one sets it. Remove the thing, swap zero. This is now actually the index of the last thing. It was the length, but now it's the index, so that's fine. We're actually swapping it out of bounds, which is in bounds. We know it's in bounds. Um, we got the index. Uh, you got these things. Okay. Hmm. One second, I gotta switch up my music. Uh, Hmm. Okay. You have to use self data swap? Yeah, yeah, you're right. Thank you. Um, rent. This is going to be self data self in use, right? That's the old value. It's slower. Damn. 
It's not broken or wrong, is it? Um... I think it's these checks. It's still correct, I think. Oh, this could be rewritten as, yeah, I, I agree. Shouldn't matter, but yeah. Um, We have that in the other implementation too. But, I think, Vectors are getting a special treatment. Okay. Why is that slower? Is it maybe the special casing? That's actually really interesting. Maybe it's these. Um, if left is Um, perf, 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 perf. Still, it's still not fast, but that's fine. I didn't expect it to be fast yet. Um, Naughty time. Time to get naughty. Let's fucking go, baby. Let's get naughty. Let's play game. Spot the memory corruption. 
What in what condition is their memory corruption? Or more specifically undefined behavior. Oh Wow I'm pretty surprised Fetching data, even if it's greater than that? Oh, yeah. Yeah, we got some major problems. Also, uh... In what condition will it read out of bounds? Actually, will it? Yeah, it'll, always, yeah, it'll, it'll definitely read out of bounds. What condition will it read out of bounds, though? What do you have to do? Um, get a, store the value of B into A, then store the old value of A into B, right? Now we'll swap. Oh, yeah, and then we'll just do, um, um, swap. Um, these should be marked unsafe, but whatever. Since they're not, we can do this, uh, but they should be marked unsafe. Um, set A with old B, set B with old A, and then we'll return old B. No, old A. Pop min should not oob, and insert should panic on insertion at the end. Oh, technically, right now it will. Um, but this will still this will still go oob. But there's a there's there's a condition that has to be met for it to go oob. One fifty seven sets. Uh, Val U thirty two. So then we're going to do self set index val. Swap. Get. Um. Swap. Wow, I'm really surprised. I'm really surprised. What the fuck? Okay. Okay. 
Let's look at only insertions. Makes sense. Our insertions are faster across the board. Let's see if we can optimize the insertions. Set 5% perf, hell yeah. We'll get more. Ultimately, this is not the place to get the perf. Um, so this bubbling, the so value is greater than the parent swap. Index is the parent. So is that like the 23 range? Um, is that this is the first optimization we talked about? Um, we clobber that code sucks, but whatever. Um, swap, uh, I'm curious if this will be faster. It's two loops. So it was like 23 in that range. Wait. Oh, yeah. I think it's better. What was this? 23 at 74? 23.9 at 74? At 74? 21.2! Wow! Easy! Perf! Let's fucking go! We literally added another loop! This is why Big O can go fuck itself. <laughs> we literally added another fucking loop and it's better, right? Boom! Headshot! <laughs> FPS Doug, holy shit, that's an old one. Oldie but goody. <laughs> wow! Wow! <laughs> Fucking lag. <laughs> Um, that's beautiful. We theorized that and we were right, right? We literally theorized that that would be faster and we were fucking right. We literally loop twice now. We increased the number of loopages. The looped, the lopped, the, the, we leapt. <laughs> Oh, that's sick! Chat, can we make this faster? Let's just go to 100 here. A <laughs> loop of faith. Oh, uh, we'll just go. We'll just do 100. We'll just do 100 flat. Just one test, and we'll up the iters to average it out more.
2213. Let's see if it's stable. 2213. 2175. That's not super stable. That's not incredibly stable, but we we know roughly. We know roughly what ballpark we need to see for an improvement here. But yeah, I'm just going to save that off. We've actually gotten a couple in this range, so I'm just pasting that to another screen so I can save it. 21.79 in that, in that ballpark is what we want to beat. Make it an N-way rotate instead of multiple swaps. Fucking mamma mia! Yeah, we don't want to read multiple times in here. Um... Wait until you see the optimization I have planned for Popman. It's nuts. It's nuts. I don't think I've ever seen this optimization for a binary heat before. I'm fucking pumped for it. I'm so fucking amped. Okay, uh, how do I turn this into a rotate? Is it just a rotate? Is it? Is that what? You, sh you sure I can do that? We, in we insert the one here. Per perfect example. So I want to move. So if I swap those two. It is some sort of a rotate. I think it is rotate. I think I can do rotate. Um. So we go, uh, is it rotate down? Is that what it is? We take one, move it to the top index, and push everything down. Is that true? Is that true? I take this, I put it at the the top, right? Whatever the top here is, which I know, I pre-compute that. Um Oh, that's hard. Um Well, here's what we're going to do. It's bubble upright. Um, it's not an actual rotate, but it, it's a rotate on a, on a vector, right? Like, it's, it's, yeah, it's not contiguous, right? Uh, we understand that. What we're trying to figure out is what is the ultimate effect of a rotate or uh what is the ultimate effect of swapping because then we can omit doing multiple writes per and i think it's just i think i yeah So what do I do? I read ahead, I, I read the parents, I write the parents, right? Read parent, write the parent to where I am, then read its parent and write that to here, and go all the way until I get to the top, and when I get to the top, then I just write in the new value, right? That's it. We're gonna have to write tests for this shit too. But we know how many swaps we want to do. So instead of doing the swaps, we're just going to do the writes, right? So we're going to read the parent. And we have to read the parent. Makes sense. I see, but if you swap in the opposite direction, you could do one write per swap. That's what we're going to do. We're going to do one write and one read per swap. 
right? Instead of two reads, two writes. We have to read the parents, and we have to go bottom up. We can't go top down. Um, the, the, reason why, the reason why we can't go top down, that's what I thought, is like push everything down. We don't know which way things go in the tree downward, so we have to go up. Because downwards you have two choices, but upwards you only have one, if that makes sense. Um, so p val, uh, parent val is self.get parent, right? So we're going to get the parent val. And then we're going to do self.set at the current index. Oh, I was, whoa, no, maybe I didn't make it faster. This is wrong. This is wrong. Um, index. This needs to be temp. Now it's dependent. This probably hurts perf. Yeah, we maybe, maybe it wasn't faster. This might be slower now. Yeah, 26. It's actually worse. Fuck. Yeah, there's that dependency. Now we can get rid of, we can try and reduce those swaps and try and get that perf back. But we didn't, we didn't actually have a perf improvement with the two loops with the swap algo, which is fine. Totally fine. But doing two loops allows us, I mean, can we just do it in one loop and just store the old value? Yes. Yeah, we can just do it with one loop, can't we? Can't we? Yeah, we can just do it with one loop, for sure. Um, pval is equal to self get parent. We have to do that. We have to get the parent anyways. So we already have read that value. Then what we're gonna do is self.set the index that we're at, and we'll set it to the pval. And that's it. When we get to the end, um, so once we set that, we set this to the parent, and we have swapped with the parent. So at the very end, we do self.set index is val, right? So we don't even need that. We don't need to put it to the end of the array, do we? Um, do it before we break. We can break in two spots. That's the only reason. Get the number in use. Update in use. Um... So, index is zero. So if it's empty, index is zero, break, and then we set the zeroth element. Let's say there are two things in there, just two, two things in here. Uh, in use will be one, index will not be zero. Um, we'll get the parent, which will be zero. We'll read zero. If the value is greater than that one, then we will set the value here with the parent. So we'll move the parent down. It'll half the number of writes and the number of reads. Actually, it'll more than half the number of reads, right? If we look at our original implementation in this, right? This is one write. And then for each iteration, a read to check and then two reads and two writes. This is now one read, one write, instead of three reads, two writes. It's a huge difference. It's a massive fucking difference. Um, and this is correct, is it not? Is this good as it stands? Set this value. Um... Yeah, because we're always following the original value. Seems good. Please. Hey! It's, an, it's not massive, but it is an improvement. Twenty four one five.
Okay. Let's try this. Um... Uh, yep, get that set, <laughs> set that. All right, 2415 is the number to beat. Okay, it's a bit slower. And that, I think that makes sense. The cost of the loop is greater than, uh, Yeah. Yep. Okay. I'm fine with that. So that's the complete one. Um, index self in use. And use plus equals one. We have to do that. We have to update the number of fucking things in there. Uh, can I simplify this? Mm, no. If the index is zero, break. Let's see what code gen looks like. Wow, that's pretty good. Um, okay, so basically, we uh, RDI is going to be the this pointer, I'm guessing. Uh, we read plus eight, which is gonna be in use, so get the in use counts. We then add one to the in use count, and then we store it out. Why don't you just fucking increment it, you piece of shit? I mean, I guess they want the old value. Is this seriously faster than doing like a move, read the value, and then do an increment on the memory value? I guess. I guess LEA is going to use one of the AGU ports. So these run basically in parallel. It's probably okay. This is not actually a memory access for y'all who don't read. Uh, x86. So this is going to check whether or not in use is, or the, the basically if index is zero. If index is zero, then it's going to jump here. It's going to zero R, out R8D, R8D, and it's going to use that as an index. Ah, that doesn't seem better. Why? Come on, dude. That's a dependent write operation. Oh, fuck off. Come on, dude. Oh, no! Oh, my God, dude. Spot that massive performance bottleneck. Holy shit! Are you kidding me right now?
sp spot the egregious performance issue. I'll give you a hint. You got you got 30 seconds until you have a hint. I'm start I'm starting a stopwatch. 30 seconds until you get a hint. What the ever-loving fuck? Ten seconds. Ten seconds. All right, you're out of time. Okay. It is reloading the pointer to the fucking box every iteration. Every single iteration, it is reloading the pointer to the box. Which is then turning this into a dependent load on a fucking pointer. Like, literally just, just deref RDI up here, store it into R8, fucking cash out R8, or find another scratch register. What the ever-loving fuck are you doing? What the fuck? Like we have we have the one read. So this is this is basically taking the uh, the index, subtracting one, then we divide it by two, um, and then we get the pointer to the data. We then uh, we then get the value at the parent. This is pval, is get parent, is right here. Then we check if it's above or equal. Uh, then we write, and then we update the index. And then we check if it's zero and we loop again, right? And that's basically this. It moved this to the end of the loop, which is totally fine because it does it outside the loop first. What the fuck? That must be an aliasing issue. Is that because I'm using a function to do dot get? I mean, here it's fine with it. Oh, fuck off. What are you doing? Rust? Unable to reason about the get call not changing the data pointer. So it knows that this doesn't change it. It's the set call. It's the aliasing because uh, set takes a mutable ref. Let's see if we change that. Let's just set this to this. If this compiles, this might not compile. It's not going to. Um, we're just going to do... Uh, Don't worry about it. Don't worry about it, chat. Do not worry about it, chat. It is fine. Okay. <laughs> no, it's still doing it. <laughs> that was cute, though. Um, that's unfucking real. Um, there's no panic path because we were doing uh, unchecked before. There's no panic path in this code. There we go, and now it's gone.
We get the pointer, we get the length. Uh, we're always gonna use this pointer, so that's fine. We then update, we add one to the length. Uh, we check if it's zero, if it's zero, and now we have two ret paths, which is good. Two ret paths actually is what I expected. It's more correct in my opinion. Because uh, if it is zero, then you just store the value. Or, um, whoa. What are you doing? It's fucking aliasing. It, it doesn't know that this right is not aliasing. Are you fucking serious? So if we move self in use to the end. That's so bad. It's so fucking bad. If it's zero, then we go to one. Why? I mean, this is okay. Yeah, so check this out. If we do in use plus equals one first, look at this. Load a value, then we update a thing. Uh, we read the length, we LEA to increment it by one, we then store it out, then we check, then we jump here, where we then uh, XOR this, well, like, why? This is like fucking Visual Studio 98 compiler output. Why would you, why would you XOR EAX and then write to an EAX dependent fucking offset? You know that that value is zero, Clang. There is no way that this value is non-zero. Why are you emitting that? Like, here's what you should do. You should XOR EAX. You should then cons prop that this is zero. You should then delete that because it's an invalid offset. And then this should get DCE'd because the value is unused. What the fuck? Is it the same as op level three? Yeah, it should be. I think. Oh no, it's definitely different. Wow, it's definitely different. Hey, now it's doing it right. Holy shit. Does that add a... Uh... Wow. Let's see what they add. Um... Stop level. All optimizations. Yeah, O is nailies for two. That's what I thought. Okay. You're telling me that fucking there's no DCE or cons propagation in opt level two? Fuck off. Yeah, look at this. Um, it's still reloading that value every time. Like, this makes sense. If it's zero, just write the fucking value in red. But this is unnecessarily complicated, so let's move that down. It's the same effect. We don't use in use anywhere. So this should be better. Yeah. Um, it's being very literal about that pointer access, too. What the fuck are you doing, Rust? Why? Why are you derefing that? Why are you derefing that? Read the length first. Uh, I guess it, uh, it would be a, another label? 
Let's let's Uh Fucking ridiculous Index Oh, I do need it. Sorry. I'm fucking stupid. Rip. Yeah, it, need, it needs data. That makes sense. And then, uh, so I'm curious. Does this have the same code gen as if we go back to this then? Uh, fast. So we're going to go back to this. Nope. That reads it every time. Uh, this one does too. Get the pointer to the data. Get the length. If it's zero, then jump to five. Jump to five, store the value that we just got Increment the length by one and ret. Otherwise, in all other situations, we go into this loop. Uh, this is going to compute the parent index. Read the value at the parent using the old pointer to the data. Um, compare. Uh, check if we want to do our insertion. If we want to do our insertion, then insert and then update the index. If RDX is zero, um, then jump to one. Or if it's non-zero, jump to one. Otherwise, if it is zero, then we get the pointer again. That's fucking set, isn't it? This is... You fucking piece of shit. And now it's gone. Now it's gone. Wow. Wow. So now we only deref RDI once. Impressive. Now this looks basically uh, identical to what I would write. So let's, let's see what it does now. Get the pointer, get the length. If the length is zero, then we go to four, which we want to save the value, increment by one and return. Um, in all other situations, we will take R8 plus four times RCX. So that is going to get the offset to the last thing. Whoa, did you do something smart? Um, this is going to... Where is it using this? For the store? RCX. Self in use. Okay, so this this saves the pointer. To the current entry. So this is caching the pointer to the current entry. This then without using a new register 
computes the parent offset. This then reads the memory at the parent. And then this determines if we want to store to it. And if we want to store to it, um, if it's not equal to zero, then we loop again. Otherwise, we stop the loop, we write out the original value, and then we increment the in use by one and ret. This looks fantastic. This looks so good. What is it? See, op level two. Yeah, op level two is a little bit worse. Um, it's actually smaller code, but it's pretty much the same thing. The main issue is that function call is killing it. Um, okay, so how much faster do you think this is, chat? So the old one was 23.9? No, it, yeah, 23.9. Is that what it was? 23.9? 24.2. Does it not matter? Is it the same perf? Op level three, debug is true. 25.7.6, 25.11. Getting rid of LTO really hurt it. Um, okay. That's getting inlined. This definitely got inlined. Um, here's main. So this is being used Let's just go to uh, 305 There we go That is the range iterator Okay, here's where insert starts for fast insert. Let's demangle. Um, insert, so zero a thing. Uh, Wrapping sub, unconditional jump, okay. Insert. This is doing the um, 
That's the RNG. Then insert. RDTSC main. Ah, the pointer's cached, I think. So let's go to this. Let's go to one of the old impulse. Pub and pub. This is basically the original, the OG. Opt level is three. And we should have the issues here. Um, whoops. Yep. Um, and here's with LTO fat. Okay, so. What? Where's the fucking code? If it's equal, then break out of the loop. So this should be out of the loop, 676B. It's gonna be close to an RDTSC. 676B, yeah, it's the RDTSE exactly. Okay, so that bookends this. Okay, so. Six, six, EF. Insert, jump equal, 66E3. That's the iterator on the range. Move. This is the, okay, this is the actual insert logic. Seems like that got optimized relatively well. This is, uh, yep, RBP. RBP is the pointer to the parent or the index to the parent, and then this is seeing if the parent index is not equal to zero, then continue looping. Uh, otherwise, jump to 6710. That's going to do another iteration of the uh, actual loop. The RNG. Unless, like, the cost of the RNG is now the most of the cost. Uh, whoops. Oh, come on. I'm gonna swap that with that, this with that. I didn't want a new window. Oh, my God. There we go. Um... I don't think our RNG is slowing us down. Maybe it is. I mean, how is LTO a big improvement? Like,
Um, so this is storing the zero here. In use is zero. This is, uh, that's the loop iteration count, RNG. This is is that really doing that? That's not, they just stored ahead of time? Hmm, technically that works. Um, 7F. I think this is the start. It does a weird loop. I think it might have interleaved the RNG with this. It's okay. Let's keep looking. Um... So this is the start, right? Checking how many entries. If there are zero entries, then we go to 50. And if we go up to 50, then that's going to uh, generate a random value and insert that value. It basically has interleaved the RNG with uh, insertion. Um, relocation model static, yeah, that would be helpful here. Code model small. Um, read the value, compare it. If it's above or equal, store it. Test RBP, that did it in place. Those will break out the loop. I mean, that looks really good. That code gen looks plenty fine. It's actually pretty good with the interleaving that they did. Um, 2467. Now, why is it slower? Twenty four sixty. That fucking slower than this. Twenty four sixty five, twenty four six, twenty four forty eight. What well, shouldn't be faster, but it is, but it do, 24-0. Ah, this variance is so high, dude. This variance is so high. 24-6, oh, come on. Why is there so much variance? It's the same binary. Literally just fucking the allocation location? Is that like it? Literally where I'm getting stored in virtual memory? The virtual address? Like that, that, is that really it? Is that the only reason we have that much variance? I mean, obviously it could be hyper threads and stuff. My CPU usage is pretty, pretty low. But yeah, I mean, I could, uh, there's, there's that much variance in my CPU. Just getting like rescheduled or moving around could fuck that up. Um, uh, God, where would my code be for that? Um, really? Uh, 
I gotta find what project I have this code in. Uh, God, where would I have this code, man? What would I have optimized? For? I know I used this code recently. Let's go. I'm gonna let that run longer just so I can double check that we're actually pinning to that core. Good, looks good. Yeah, we are smashing that core. Okay. Hopefully that will increase the uh, determinism. Okay, 2543. Um, I just want to shut up some of these uh, things. Yeah, just so I can see more output. We're going to let this one run. It's a, it's, these are long runs, but whatever. But yeah, hopefully... This gets us a little bit better uh, info. It's just hard to benchmark things unless you're in a custom OS running on bare metal. There's just too much going on in the system. I've got like, I've got like, I don't know, eight to 10% CPU usage. That looks pretty good. Let's run it one more time just to see. That's pretty tight. We're also doing a lot more iters, but caches are hot. Uh, Getting swapped out of these threads should be pretty unlikely. Yeah, these are these are fine. These look pretty solid. That's an improvement. Okay, so Um, okay. All right, just updating another machine. We'll do uh, we'll do tests over on a different machine here. It's hopefully a little bit quieter. All right, these numbers absolutely mean nothing anymore. Uh, we're, we're shifting over to a different machine. These numbers are going to mean something completely different. So get 25 out of your head. It doesn't mean anything anymore. Okay. All 
And I just did a Rust up update as well. Yeah, I did. So Rust is all up to date. Yeah, and it's only one core that's actually getting hit here. There, there's so many cores on this system that it doesn't, it literally doesn't fucking matter if other things are happening on the system because they just won't affect this core. We, we pick core number two. I'm pretty sure the, the one bar happening on core 107 is not radically skewing our results. <laughs> there you go, 2138. <laughs> this should be very consistent now. Um, I do have turbo and some other things that will affect things, but uh, that room is, is thermally controlled and those machines are not going to be hitting thermal throttles. So, let's see. They should be like super fucking close to the previous one, hopefully. It should be very low variance. Yeah, fucking look at that! Improvements! Is your top monitor on an arm? Yes, it is. This is an Ergotech stand. All four of the monitors are on the same stand. That, that one's also an Ergotech. I, I just like him. Is the second one standard binary heap? Yes, it is. Yeah, look at that. Those numbers are consistent. That is fucking clean. It's the same as fast? Yeah, it's faster on this machine, isn't it? Isn't that cool? <clears throat> Fast, faster on the polar. Let's find the insert that's commented out. So this is the unsafe variant. So now what we're looking for is a drop in the third number. We want to see the third number go down. Say you work at SpaceX and you're responsible for programming rocket deployments. What technologies and languages would you use in terms of stability and optimization? Uh, suppose you later fly this rocket. I'm so I, it's hard for me to answer that because I have some experience with like uh, aviation and like rocket and spacecraft programming. So I'm a little bit biased by the way people already do those things. Um, Wow, that's slower. Um, but yeah, I would use a safe language and then I would try to have people not actually write things in that language. Try to basically write like a scripting language, like a Lua, not actually Lua, but write something that people can write their uh, like mathematical models in um, and either have that language get, you know, transformed into Rust and then have that Rust get compiled. Um, but it's basically a way to, like, most people who are working on, on spacecraft or aircraft um, aren't actually writing code. You don't really need to write code for most of it. A lot of it are mathematical models that describe the behaviors, uh, whether it's, like, orbital mechanics, whether it's, you know, transitions you want to do. The amount of code is, is kind of smaller than the amount of just math. So what you want to do is you want to build a really good foundation for people to do mathematical operations. And that's determining feedback mechanisms for how much to throttle up or down engines, how to pitch different aspects of a plane, how to adjust things. Like, all of those things kind of kind of matter. Um, there are, like, big companies that make these things. Uh, but a lot of them are going to compile into C, and a lot of the code bases are going to be in C, and they're going to use R tosses that are based in C. Um, and I would say moving away from that is really important. Obviously, I think Rust would be a great way to go. Uh, but in Rust, you need to make sure that you go with a no-panic model. And to do a no-panic model, you basically can't use their standard allocation model. Uh, you have to rewrite a lot of the core parts of Rust, and it won't look like standard Rust at all, or even core Rust. Um, you'll basically want to do a lot of that stuff yourself. 
Uh, you'll basically want to remove the concept of a panic from Rust and make the compiler prove to you that your code cannot panic. Because if your code can panic, you're fucked. Um, you can enforce no panic with Cori. You kind of can. The way that that's done is you basically, um, you, you basically just check to see if the panic symbol got used. But I don't think there's a proper way to do it. There's a third-party crate that does it, and it effectively makes sure that you never import the panic symbol. I would hazard that they're using the crate. That would be my guess. I'm not aware of it being part of Core Rust. If it is part of Core Rust, it might not be exposed yet, and it's uh, intrinsic or internal. So this is actually slower. Well, that's fucking news to me. Um, how the fuck is that slower? Is this worse for aliasing because we're doing raw pointers? So this is not a true solution like just use Rust. No, not at all. Um, most highly reliable things, uh, spacecraft, airplanes, stuff like that, are going to use redundant systems where you'll basically copy and paste the computer a couple times. Um, so a lot of the code is just making sure that you can do mathematical op operations that operate on three different computers, and then at the end, they vote. And they decide whether or not one of the computers is behaving incorrectly or erratically, and you kick it off the island. Um, there are plenty of ways to do that. Um, given how little code is needed for the critical components of spacecraft and airplanes, it doesn't, in my opinion, it doesn't even matter what language you do it in as long as you write really good abstractions. Because you are writing so little code that you can afford to spend so much time making sure that you baby the fuck out of developers such that they can make catastrophic programming mistakes and have it still not be an issue. That is the goal. The goal is to make it so fucking isolated from actually causing an issue. And th that's what you need to do. Like... <laughs> Um, wow. I'm surprised this is, I'm surprised that this was slower. Let's look at the full test. Just for funsies. Uh, the third number doesn't mean anything because it's not completely implemented, but the first two do matter. Wow, the Rust implementation is really fast on this machine. <laughs> what? Interesting. Interesting. Um... Let's do the same thing. Unless it's setting LTR op level three that has dramatically affected it. Nope, on this machine it's slower. <laughs> Sick. Sick. 
Sick. Sick. Sick. I guess um, I'm just not doing enough iters. Do some more iters, get some more stability on there. This is running for a long time. This is plenty stable. So on this machine, on this machine, the our naive implementation is about 50% slower than the Rust implementation. And then on this machine, our naive implementation is, I'm doing these ratios wrong. We'll say the Rust implementation is 26% slower. <laughs> Fuck! <laughs> I mean, this Rust version is quite a bit different. This is probably on 1.51. Yeah, 1.51 versus 1.48. I mean, <laughs> did they completely change the performance properties of this fucking language? <laughs> uh... They updated LVM. Really? When? Where, where's the fucking patch notes? Where's my patch notes? <laughs> uh select nth unstable oh some stuff is made const good big fan okay what else That's the most recent release. Um, I forget where the good place to look for that shit is. Um, where is it? Where is it? Thank you. Um... Oh yeah, these, no, this is just releases. Th this won't have nightly. Um, fuck, where's the nightly shit? Um... Fuck. I know I know that they have a thing. I I remember like trying to find it before and it's always a pain in the ass. Let's see when they updated the LVM. One point five. January 5th. Mm, this didn't change anything. This is just bumping LVM from... This is just like a two-month bump in LVM. What? You can now use constant values for X and XN. Ooh. Um. 
Oh, that's cool. Minus one can be a uh, an option file, specialized. Bool then. Ah, we got the then some, or we got then. Oh, maybe that has then some as well. Or insert with key. Ensures a value in the entry before inserting. If empty, take the key as the argument. Oh, okay, cool, cool. Oh, the clamps are really nice. I'm glad we got clamps. Basically min and max in one, which is really nice in my opinion. Those are good. These are now constant, which is really nice. Mm. Yeah, are they still on LVM 11? Is it that big of a difference? I don't think so. Dude, why is GitHub not loading? Okay. Um Yeah, they didn't really change much about that. They they bumped to the version and maybe LVM in 3 months without a major rev or even a minor rev bump made massive improvements. Uh but I don't think so. That doesn't make sense to me. Um let's take a look at if they improve the beach tree stuff that would be in i guess this is the compiler library uh let's look at is it in standard no that's just hash they have it in alec then Six aliasing issue. Ooh, what was this? So before. Oh, they do on checks inside. Why is this an aliasing issue? Get unchecked. Because they have two active pointers to self data. Is that the problem? They, they have a mutable and a non mutable pointer at the same time. Dude, aliasing is so fucking hard, man. Yeah, but here they just make both mute. And then copy using the same pointer. I don't know, is that first one actually an issue? God, that's fucking tough. Why is this... Huh. Interesting. Um remove branches. Whoa. One point four nine? Is this in? Is tagged one four nine, so I should have that. No. Oh. 
Did they make big improvements? Did they make... That's a pretty major internal improvement. Wow. Wow. What's going on on the uppermost screen? Just the top. Um, Doc Elias is cool. Rebuild heuristic. That's from merges. Shrink to You've been on the GME short squeeze or anything? No, I don't really care about it. Um I think, I think my favorite part about GME is that a bunch of people decided to basically artificially decrease the supply of a stock and then get really mad when the supply of a stock is low. <laughs> I think that's my favorite fucking part. Our goal is to push this stock up and no one sell so that there are no stocks available for purchase. And then we're going to get really mad and then make lawsuits when the stocks are not available for purchase. Fucking idiots. <laughs> I, have, I have no problem with the actual underlying premise, but no one even remotely knows how markets works. It's kind of fucking funny. Why won't Robinhood let me get more than five shares? <laughs> because no one's selling that's the whole point <laughs> you fucking dinks <laughs> oh my god <laughs> not really what happened though I mean ultimately what happened is they didn't have enough money to cover the, the float the three day float Right, like the, the brokerages just didn't have the float to handle it. But, but still, it's, just, it's kind of funny. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, a bunch of people don't know what margin is, which is fucking ridiculous. A bunch of people have n no idea what options are, and they're all trading options on margin. Like, go fuck yourself. Like, you can't fucking complain that you're getting margin called and that, like, the broker is not letting you borrow shit to make things that literally in, like, one hour could mean that you are in debt the size of your position. It's just ridiculous. Like, trading on cash? Sure, you should be able to hit the fucking markets and you should be able to just buy as much stock as people are willing to sell to you. Um, but ultimately that's not how the markets work, right? There's, there's margin, there's borrowing. If you want to be able to, if you want to be able to deposit money into an account and you want to be able to emerge, immediately purchase a stock, you are getting a three day loan from the broker who is mainly going from their intermediary, right? Um, and the reason is because in the U.S., money can't really move faster than three days. So any time that you get an instant deposit and you can trade on that money, which most services offer now, you are trading on someone else's money, right? Now, technically, 
your money will be there soon, so, like, you've already paid off the loan, but it doesn't mean the money has been received yet. Um, and when everyone's fucking buying this, like, Robinhood is a great example where literally no one on Robinhood actually, like, is doing reasonable investments. Uh, and thus they are floating a lot of money because people are doing a lot on margin and a lot of things in those three-day windows. It's the same with when you sell stock. If you sell stock and then buy new stock with the proceeds that you got from the stock that you just sold, you're still in a three-day window before those funds settle, which means if you buy again, you're being lended to. And that money doesn't come from fucking nowhere. And that's basically what happened in the Robin Hood scenario is that money got depleted, which makes fucking sense. <laughs> it just makes sense. There's a limited pool of money that they can have for floating people and basically letting them trade more frequently than they actually can trade based on their cash. But yeah. How long, uh, how long will you guess it'll keep on? I think probably for another week or two. Until people run out of interest. Um, or until there's a crash that causes people to panic. Unfortunately, a lot of these people putting money into this cannot afford to do it. And that's the, that's the part that really disappoints me. Like... A lot of these people cannot afford it. A lot of them, and it's not necessarily that they can't afford to buy the stock. It's not like they're borrowing someone's money. It's that they need that money for other things. Um, I don't like that. <laughs> like, you're not really stealing from the rich, unfortunately. You are basically just giving your money away to people who have larger positions, and you're giving money away to the market makers that short the options, because a lot of these people are buying fucking naked options, and when the premiums, when literally to make one cent on your options, you need the price to move 50%, you are getting fucked. You are literally getting destroyed you the you are basically walking into a casino and playing a game where you have like a 10 percent chance to actually win fucking money because options if you purchase options they are insurance and by nature insurance always has to be higher than the risk and that means your upside on average i'm not saying you can't make money but on average your gains have to be less than the risk of the seller, which means you are always playing at a loss. If you only trade naked options by buying options and you don't own the underlying stock and you aren't using them as a hedge and you're not shorting options, you will always lose all of your money over time. Always, always. Because you are literally buying insurance. <laughs> the only way that you can make money by buying options, that's not a hedge, naked options, is one, getting lucky, which is not sustainable, or two, fundamentally, the economics that the entire world is built upon, like black skulls, is fundamentally incorrect, and you found a new formula that is better, and you're using it to arbitrage against black skulls. Those are your two fucking options. Other than that, you are always losing money over time. Always. Always. Do you know how many day traders lose money? Like 90%. The, the fucking SEC is forced to publish this statistics, and it's like 10% of traders actually are profitable. So when all your fucking, like, it's always engineers. When all your engineering buddies are talking about how much money you're making, they're making, they're fucking lying. They're lying. They're lying through their fucking teeth. There's no way <laughs> that they are all making money. They're pretty much all losing money. Trading in the stock market is the best fucking way to lose money. <laughs> it is stupid. You're better off just going to a casino. You seriously, seriously, you have better odds at a casino than on the stock market. For trading. For trading. And when I mean trading, I mean buying and selling things frequently, like a couple times a week. If you're doing long-term things, then yes, that's a lot better than a casino. But trading... 
Mathematically, statistically, you are going to lose money. <laughs> you are going to fucking lose money. <laughs> it's literally priced against you. Any t the, the more you do short-term trading, the more you're, you're multiplying those 0.4 rates together. It's stupid. The stock guru is making money by selling you the secret stack, stat, strats. Yeah, because they don't make money on the stock market because no one does. There are not many rich traders. Can, can, can chat, chat, can you, can you name a rich trader? A famous trader? Can you? No, you fucking can't because no one's famous for trading because none of them make fucking money. <laughs> like seriously dude <laughs> like Warren Buffett's not a trader he's an investor exactly <laughs> there's a reason you don't see multi-billion dollar fucking traders they don't exist <laughs> it's stupid <laughs> Uh, let me, let me see if I can find the stats. Your dollar's at risk. Let's, let's see. This is 2005. And 2005 is when people who wanted to trade had to put in a lot of fucking effort to do it. They don't, they don't invest. Yup. It's stressful and expensive. Depend heavily on borrowing money. Don't believe it's easy profits. Watch out for hot tips because it's bullshit. Uh, remember that educational things are not very objective. Let's see if I can find the stats on this. Average rate of return. Uh, is this average rate of return of uh, profitable <laughs> traders? Because that's probably profitable traders. It's the same thing when people are like, CEOs make so much money. I would say the average CEO probably loses money because you don't see in like census data, no one is employed as a CEO for the business that went bankrupt last year, right? If that makes sense. So like you don't really see the people who lose money when you look at people who are employed to do that thing. <laughs> um, ah, what is it? I forget where the fucking data is. I know it has to be, it's like published or some shit. Um, and it's, it's bad. It's like 10, 20% of traders make money. Like, <laughs> it's so bad. And the more you trade, the more likely you are to realize those losses. Um... There's a reason why trading stuff is just so fucking slimy. Like... Yeah, I don't know. I, I don't know where I could find that. Um, this is Forex. <laughs> yeah, look at this. Winnings per trader last month. For 50 traders. Yeah, yeah, let's, see, let's, take a look at, let's take a look at that one. So, you are one of these 50 people. <laughs> Basically, 30% of them lost all of their money. <laughs> all of it. Another 30% lost between, like, 40 and all of their money. And then, like, 10% lost 20% of their money, and then like 10% made between 20 and 80%. This is fucking stupid. About a third of traders achieved a total loss of close to, <laughs> a total loss or close to, 90% or more loss. You have a 33% chance of losing all of your money. <laughs> <laughs> Sixteen percent of traders achieved a profit. The average loss was minus forty-eight point five percent. Woo! 
<laughs> yeah, in a casino, at least you have like a 48% chance of making a profit, not a fucking 16. Imagine a casino had a game that had a 16% chance of making money. <laughs> like no one would fucking play. Oh my god, dude. Just don't believe trading. When people say they are successfully trading, they're losing money. And you know how people say they successfully trade? As someone who has had some bad years trading and some good years trading, I'll tell you exactly two, two quick tr tricks on how to appear as a good trader. And here we go. Here's the data. On average, 56.5% of the trades were completed with a profit. Well, over half of my trades make me a profit. Yeah, that lines up with about my trades. But most people let the losers run a little bit too long and let the gainers run not enough too long. So you have a situation where you have this, you know, this smart, nerdy fucking kid sitting next to you, always engineers. I don't fucking know why, because they think they're smart and can beat the market. And they have a 56% win rate on their trades, except their winners are much smaller than their losers. And you just say, you only talk about the good trades that you have, and congratulations, you sound like a profitable trader. But in reality, you're fucking hemorrhaging money. Stop! <laughs> Stop! But yeah, uh, basically, uh, it's just a fucking scam. It's a scam. Invest. If, if you're not holding something for more than like three fucking months, you are just deleting your money, go to a casino, or just hold it in cash. <laughs> like, it's so fucking stupid. <sighs> like, it's just fucking dumb. It's just... I hate it so much, and I hate that Wall Street Bets is kind of, like, uh, glorifying it and make like, I can guarantee you that GME has been responsible for probably thousands of people basically getting a gambling addiction, and it's fucking sad. I'm sorry. Like, a lot of these people are getting into trading, getting an account for the first time, and... You're creating, like, lifelong fucking addicts. It's... It's really bad, man. It's really fucking bad. Like, it's just... It's causing more damage than it's damaging the fucking funds. Like, who fucking cares if a hedge fund goes bankrupt? That doesn't matter. It doesn't really affect anyone working at the hedge fund. You know who it does affect? The people who have their pensions or whatever invested in that hedge fund who don't have a say in where it's invested, so they get fucked. The people actually doing the fund? No, they just go bankrupt, get bailed out, or start a new hedge fund. It doesn't matter. It, it, doesn't, it doesn't affect them at all. They're not having a bad, like, they're having a bad day because their fucking fund is going up. But it, it's a bad day because it means they're going to have to spend two years making a new fund, distancing themselves from the old fund, and recollecting some new uh, funding. Like, going out and finding new investors. Um, but it is definitely causing people to put up money that they should not be putting up and to be getting gambling addictions they should not have and causing people to go into debt on trades that are going highly negative against them and margin calls on something as volatile as GME are not active enough to prevent you from going negative. And it's just, I like the sentiment. I think it's a cool sentiment. I think it's fun that people are having fun with it. But I think it would be a lot better if people actually were educating themselves on how the markets work, how unfair certain things are, how few traders actually make a profit, most traders losing money. Uh, like, people should be learning how options work, how underlying contracts work, how futures work, how writing options work, how covered calls are. Like, basically... If you want to trade and spew money, then at least turn it into an educational experience. 
what I see on Wall Street bets is not educational. I'm not talking about the memes. Seriously, I'm not talking about the memes. The memes don't bother me at all. People just having fun, being goofy, being silly. That's not what I'm talking about. But the educational and analysis things are typically just fucking wrong. It's a disservice to people's understandings of the things that you're able to do in the markets. Diamond hands. Like, saddest thing is people who are trading their life savings in their house. Yeah, I mean, there are definitely people who are like, I don't know, man. It's just, yeah. It's just not good. It makes me sad. Didn't know you were talking finance. Didn't know you talking finance is what I needed, but great stream as always. Yeah, oh, absolutely. Yeah. Like, of course, have fun with GME. If you have the money to throw money away, like I threw money at GME for fucking fun. But I also know that I in no way, shape, or form need that money at all. I don't need it now. I won't need it later. I don't give a fuck. That's not the case for most people. If people, like, Robin Hood in general is very... You can, you can see. Go look up the old Robin Hood videos. You can see the way that Robin Hood uh, likes to pick the people who use their app and likes to promote to a certain type of individual. Idiots. They know it. And they talk about it blatantly. Like... Basically, the goal of Robin Hood is to get as many uninformed people hooked on trading. Because it's addictive, it's profitable if you're a broker, and it's profitable if you're on the other side or front-running those trades. But it hurts that my friends makes a lot of money and I don't. Yeah, that's pretty, that's pretty popular. Like, I mean... A lot of people are going to lie. Most people trading lie, right? If you were to do a public survey on like Wall Street bets of like how many people are making or losing money, it'd be like 95% of people are making money trading. They're lying. They're lying. They're delusional. I'm sorry. I've done it. I've been hooked on trading. I am addicted to trading. And I lie about trades all the fucking time. So does everyone else. And I don't even have a need to lie about the trades because I've got plenty of successful trades. Like, by luck. <laughs> Seriously, I traded, I basically traded at a loss for like five or six years until I had an outrageously lucky streak last year that basically allowed me to become a profitable trader because over the course of like two weeks, I 10x'd my money. If it weren't for that, I would have cumulatively lost like 200 grand trading in like 10 years of trading. It's fucking trash. <laughs> I literally got lucky that I recovered it. It's fucking ridiculous. <laughs> Top growing subreddits, Wall Street Bets, Robinhood, Dogecoin, Penny Stocks Investing. Yeah, it's people trying to get a quick fucking profit. Here's the thing. <laughs> the quicker you want to get a profit, the more profitable being patient is, if that makes sense. The more people who are moving money around daily and are impatient and trying to get that next thing, the more, just by nature of how economics works, the more profitable long-term investing becomes. And it's the same in video games, right? If someone buys up a bunch of one item, right? And then sells that item two days later when they have a 5% return on investment. And then do it again with the next item. And then do it again with the next item. And do it again with the next item. You're constantly getting those cuts taken out, those commissions, those fees, those taxes, and those sorts of things. You're missing out on dividends and other sorts of things. While a long-term person, right, it's... The markets are not a zero-sum game, right? They kind of are, but commissions and fees and taxes make it not a zero-sum game, especially with double taxing in the markets um, or infinite taxing in the markets. But effectively, since it's not a zero-sum game, patient people always win. 
That's just how it is. Like, universally, even for things not related to money or trading, the more greedy and aggressive people are trying to get growth, the more you make by being patient. Because you are the one selling the risk. You are the ones basically pushing the, the risk burden on someone else, right? If that makes sense. Lose 200k, I have 2k left, 10x your net worth, you're now 20k. That's a big thing that a lot of people don't understand. <laughs> if you lose 80% of your money, you now have to 5x your money to get your money back. That is something that a lot of people do not understand. Um, you didn't want markets got you addicted to stock trade. More the other way around. But yeah, turtle wins the race. It, it's, it's, it's important to understand that, right? Like, it's just kind of how it is in life, right? The people who do long-term things are the people who are basically reaping the rewards of all the high-frequency, fast action that's going on, right? I'm 15 years long on Apple. I'm way up. Yeah, absolutely. Like, absolutely. If you lost it, you gotta get it back, right? I mean, I got lucky, right? And I just, I just do it for fun. I mean, at, at, at one point, I invested more money than I probably should have. But at this point in my life, I have a YOLO account that is big enough to, like, change my life if I have crazy things happen, like last year when I fucking, like, 10 x it. But it's also money I don't give a shit about anymore. I used to care about that money, but now I don't. And there's a reason why that, that money is the money I have in GME. <laughs> there's a big difference between investments and having fun. But... Yeah. I don't know. It's just interesting. It's like, I'm all for it. I'm all for fucking the system. I'm all for financial reform. I'm all for uh, faster, uh, you know, liquidity in the market. I'm all for um, not having the three-day window on trades and having markets that take less commissions and brokers that take less commission, less corruption, less insider trading, more public information. Like, all of these things. I'm not saying I'm against these things. Ultimately, I think... There's a lot of harm and a lot of people who think they're in a sure thing to have this thing go to 10k. And if it doesn't, and it might, it fucking might. But if it doesn't, there are a lot of people who are losing their rent and getting a new addiction. And it's just sad. It's just, it's, I don't know. Like, and maybe that's part of the meme, right, of Wall Street bets is that you are memeing about a thing that you know is fundamentally bad, but there's still a level of everyone memeing about it and talking about it like it's acceptable when it's really not, right? I'm curious how what moment did you decide to invest in GME? Uh, like $50, like four or five days ago. It was, no, it might've been like the Friday before last, when it was starting to go crazy. Um, I basically made like a bunch of uh, pretty interesting like options trades where effectively I make a shit ton of money if it goes up past like, like 300 or $250, which was ridiculous back then, but isn't. So I make a lot of money if it's over that, but I also make a lot of money if it goes like under 30 and then kind of everything in between, I lose a little bit of money, right? So I basically made like a volatility play, which... At the time, I thought was a good investment, but now it's looking like uh, <laughs> it's not the best. But yeah, yeah, a bunch of covered calls and 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 covered shorted puts and and shit. I like writing options. Uh, as I was talking before, how basically selling options, you are the insurer, which means you are, as long as our formulas are correct or 
the formulas are being used, right? It doesn't really matter if Black Skulls is correct if it's what everyone uses to price options, if, if that makes sense, right? If everyone is doing the wrong thing, it doesn't mean it's not happening. Um, but yeah. Wall Street Bets used to be about a traders who lost a lot of money in stocks, yeah. I think people are just, a lot of people are just, Sadly, really hopeful that this is going to change their life for the better. Mathematically, it isn't. And it's, it is going to change probably 5% of people's lives. And those 5% of people are going to get upvoted to the fucking top. And they're 5% of people. <laughs> Can't stand watch prep for my own live stream. Hell yeah. Can't wait to see it. I don't know how much longer I'm going to be streaming, but we'll see. I'll see if I can tune in. Fuck yeah. What does upvoted mean? It just means people uh, basically click that they like it, which causes it to go more to the top. It's an echo chamber. I think echo chambers are very dangerous for trading. <laughs> very dangerous. There's a reason why all the profitable traders basically sell you trading tips. <laughs> because trading tips are profitable. <laughs> oh, internet's becoming echo chambers. Yeah, that's pretty fair. To some good extents and some bad extents. Ups and downs. More polarizing. All right. Uh, yeah, I have no idea. I, I mean, I guess we saw that there was an improvement in rust. And is that it? Is it that rust? Is it that rust optimized their... They just optimized it? They made it better? Because it... These, these machines are not micro-architecturally much different. Like... Um, uh, are you going to update Rust? I don't know. It's too hard on gaming. It'll take too long. And I don't even know if I can. Let me see. Yeah. Unfortunately, the... Rust in Gentoo doesn't have a nightly branch. And I kind of wish it did, but it doesn't. Um, yeah. Hmm. Oh, well. Um. Shit. So what version was fastest here? Oh, the last one shouldn't be valid. Is it? Do we still have an insert for this? Okay, let's see if we can make this the last one faster. I do think I can make pop min faster and have a, a better implementation there. You just lose 50 billion on a bad trade, kill your entire bank, face jail time, but instead, just go on a book and speaking to her. Hell yeah. Oh, did that make it worse? It did make it worse. I would hope so. Okay. So this one seems to be better. 
Um, data, insert, pop, pop, pop. Okay. So we've optimized inserts. We get the data. We do offsets. We do everything on safe in there. And that looks pretty good. It looks like we made that faster by changing this. Right, and this is the old naive version. So what we're, what we're trying to do is beat the performance of now the new Rust implementation. Um, this looks pretty good. Get in use, break if we're at the root, get the parent, read the parent, write in the parent if we need to. Um, we keep around the old index. Is this correct? I think it is get the parent, read the value at the parent. If the new value is larger than the parent's value, then we want to bubble up, we're going upwards. So you want to write the parent value at our current location, and then we want to go to the parent. Uh, and we keep going, so this is going to keep going up until eventually, um, this is wrong in the break case, isn't it? I think this is wrong, guys. Um, okay, if there's no swap, then we just write it in at index. Yeah, I think this is wrong. Shouldn't this always unconditionally be updated to parent? Like even here, shouldn't it be like index is equal to parent here as well? Right? Um, no. It shouldn't. Because um, index is self in use. Oh, yeah, and then we write it. Okay, yeah. So we just, we add it to the end. Yeah, I think this is actually correct. We'll write tests for this shit later. It'll be easy to fix. Um, I'm not afraid that we're really breaking the algorithm here, to be honest. Okay, so we want to optimize this one as well. All right. So, so this, I don't think we can improve this. <laughs> this is pretty clean. Pop max, too bad. Um, What we're going to do is get the original value. So decrement in use. And then we'll do a uh, let data is data as um, OK. Offset self in use plus 1. Right, so this is um, if in use is greater than zero, if nothing is in here, then it's none. Uh, in this situation, if it's greater than zero, then this is just this leftover case, uh, and that's just uh, in use is zero, and then we want to get the zeroth element, so we'll just do uh, data, uh, just data. All right. So just deref data. And then here we have the, what was this doing? This is getting, let's just split this so we can see. Um, we want to get the, yeah, get the value we're removing. And this is just add data, right? And then this is uh, decrease the amount of elements as we removed one. But I, I do think I've got a pretty nutty algorithm in my head. And I'm really curious how fast I can make it. So index of the value that we're pushing down, which is 0. Oh, actually. Um, mm, 
Ne? Okay. Get the original value. Decrease the amount of elements. So how can I cut down on swaps here? So uh, this is correct. Set in use to zero and then just return the zero thing. This is if it's empty, return none. So this should build. I don't know if this is going to work, to be honest. There's a chance this doesn't work. Yeah, I don't think this works because we don't do a swap. This might just never complete. It's just, uh, we'll cut down on the iters, because this should be instant, and if it doesn't complete, then we know that we, that we seriously broke it. Okay. I don't think it's actually that fast, um, because I don't see where we actually write in the last value ever. Index of the value we're pushing down. So I, I want to swap the last thing with the start. Do I just want to do that right away? Um, right, left, right, we get the left and the right. We need, we need to read both of them, so we might as well just do it. Let the compiler reorder those. Can't do it right away because you don't know the last thing. Yeah, um, so this I want to, you know, simplify. Um, all right, I gotta hit the head, beer back. Okay, um, so what we're going to do is uh, get the value that we're removing. This is the uh, return value, right? Then we want to um, decrease the amount of elements as we removed one. And then we'll do uh, let the um, yeah, uh, get the um, uh, last value. So this is going to be let. This is the value, right? This is the actual value that we're going to be pushing down. Um, and the value that we're going to be pushing down is uh, found at data offset self in use, right? The last element there. Then we need to compute, so we're at zero. So we basically have a value. This is the value that is currently at the root node. It, it's not, we didn't store it there yet because we don't need to store it there yet because we don't know where it's going to finally end up. So we're gonna do the same logic as up here where we're not actually going to save the value into memory until we know where it's going to stay forever. So here we never actually move a value. We never swap or move something. And we're gonna do the same algorithm here. We have to read this. I guess we don't have to read it right away. We'll, we'll end up replacing it, um, I think. We'll see. 
we get the last value. This is the value that we are now putting at the root. So it is technically stored at index. Um, but it's not yet. We didn't write it. We didn't commit that. Um, and that's because we're probably shuffling it down. So what we're going to do is check what's below us, to the left and to the right in the tree. Then we're going to determine, uh, we need to determine the bounds of left and right. Um, and we'll just use this logic for now. Uh, if left eye is greater than in use or right eye, then there's nothing else to do. In this situation, uh, it's left. In this situation, it's left. Uh, in this situation, it's right. Um, can we determine the bounds before reading the values? I'm not too worried about that yet, because this logic I want to rewrite. Um, I just want to get this working. And then, that's get index. Well, we don't have to read at index, because we know the value at index is our value. So we're just going to say, if the small value is greater than, it's not small value, but if the small value is larger than our value, if a child is larger than us, then we want to store an index, we want to store in our position. So for the first iteration, this would be the root position. We want to store the small value. And then we want to update our index. And then once we finally get to the end and break out, we want to do data offsets at index. This is where we finally have decided that we want to insert the actual value, right? And I think that this logic is actually correct, right? So figure out which one is larger. If this logic is wrong, I'm just ignoring that. We're just saying if this is correct, if the value below us is larger than our value, then store the larger value, uh, which we'll, we'll rewrite like all of this code. So I don't really care that the code is unreadable. Um, store at index. So we would start, this would be the root node. If, the, if a child node is larger than us, then it will be stored at the root instead. So we'll store it at the root. We'll update that the index uh, is now the small index because we swapped with that child and we continue on. Once we get to a point where there's no children that is smaller than us, we will break out and we will write our actual value there. So in the case of a root node where we actually move the smallest value somehow to the top, um, then this would not happen. This break would occur and we would store value at index, which is zero, uh, which is good. And then a ridge, this is uh, return value. Do I have an ridge? Yeah, okay. Um, yeah. And of course, this is not complete. We This is not safe, right? We're doing unsafe things. We haven't add, added in any bounds checks yet. Um, okay. Uh, the number of iterations, I think, is just too small to get good data. Okay, it's running for at least a second, which is good. Means caches are warmed up, things are behaving uh, relatively predictably. Wow. Did we really make it slower? Because we're not doing swaps. Really? The old version was faster? Press an X to doubt there. Potentially doing more loads? Am I? Oh, because of the bounds? Um, I think I can do this. Right? Uh... 
Uh, sorry, Min. Right? Well, it's a max heap. So basically, if we were to have this as max, then we would, if this was max, then this would always get bubbled up to the top. This is not a valid entry. If it's min, this will never get bubbled. And since this will never get bubbled, we don't actually have to do any conditional checks, right? That's the logic. It, it's it's impo even though it's in this value does not exist in the set, but it will never actually become part of the set because the zero will never get moved since we're not doing equal comparisons. Uh, even if there is a zero, it would never get moved into the in use range of the heap, and thus it's not present. So. This is a soft version of the optimization that I'm thinking about. But the serious optimization that I'm thinking about, now that I can reveal it, is going to be on an insertion. Basically, over allocate the heap, right? Over allocate the size of the heap, and on an insertion, write to the children, the left and right children, and replace them with zero. And basically, then we don't even need to do this check because up here, we make sure that for every node that is in the in-use range, basically as long as we use in-use correctly when we're walking, we can do the expensive checks here, which are not that expensive, to make sure that the children are in bounds, fill them in with zeros, and then this can do no conditionals at all. It can just read the children. Even if they're out of bounds, we know that the children are still in bounds. This means we might end up allocating two times larger of an array than we need to have, but it means that we can unconditionally read both the left and the right children. And yeah, you can just unconditionally read both children. And then you can just check whichever one is smaller. And if they're both out of bounds, they're both zero. So it doesn't matter. If only one is in bounds, then only one of them is zero. So all you have to do is determine which one is smaller. And then you just fill in that entry. Isn't that cool? Isn't that an interesting idea? The idea is that the conditional logic, it, well, there's not really any conditional logic. You're computing the children's. Uh, you're computing the children's indices, filling them in with zero, and then you get rid of almost all of the conditional logic here. Um, that is that is my end goal. Uh, fuck it, we can do it now. Let's do it now. So this is inserting the value. Um... What we need to do is we need to do data offset um, self in use. That's the index, right? Which may be zero uh, times two plus one as i size is equal to zero, right? So this is zero out the children, right? It's unconditional. So we know that we are going to fill in something at in use. So what we're going to do is we're going to make sure at in use, both of the children are zero, right? This is, this is correct. There's nothing wrong with this logic, right? Uh, and we can say index here. So those are filled in with zero, or more specifically, we can just say uh, standard u32 min, right, which is zero. Uh, so this is um, mark the children as um, 
the bottom uh, most values, right? And then that means that here we can just read them. Because <laughs> we don't care if they're inbounds or not because their values encode their validity. That makes sense? And then here, all we need to do is determine which index is smallest. I guess we can just say if left eye is greater than value, then we store the left. Oh, uh, we do need to do multiple things. I think it's going to be slower because more stores and loads. I th I think I disagree just due to the conditionals are conditional. This, right, the processor can queue these up in parallel. It can queue them up in parallel. It can speculate these because this index does not change. From the start of this function to way down here, these loads, this math can be done in the background. It can be queued up in a store buffer. It can be thrown out to memory. These basically to a processor are free, right? They just don't exist. Nothing here costs anything. They're done in parallel. Um, this arithmetic, this computation, these can both be done in a load, right? These are, this is just two instructions. This is an immediate encodable value. This is a, like, let's say this is RDI. Let's say data is the pointer and it's RDI. This is literally RDI plus whatever this is, let's say this is RSI, R RDI plus RSI times two plus one, and then this is RDI plus RSI times two plus two, uh, and it's a single move instruction of an immediate value. These are two single instructions, nothing else. They don't use up register value, so you don't need to spill a register. They're just two stores, that's it. And these stores happen in two cycles. So basically one store per cycle. So the question is, if, if this store does not happen until, if basically if all of this processing costs more than two cycles, then these are free, right? Basically all of this added up has to be less than two cycles for these to actually have a real effect on the processor because these will go to store ports that are dedicated to stores. Their arithmetic can be done on the one of the AGUs and the store ports I think have an AGU. If they don't, it's still fine because the AGU will be in, uh, not in use. This is a dependent load on a mathematical operation, which is going to cause this to bottleneck, which will cause this to bottleneck, which means this if conditional cannot be evaluated until four cycles, because this load will take four cycles to finish, which means this cannot happen until four cycles because it's waiting for this value, barring speculation which means that these two things can literally happen while the processor is waiting for that load to happen in the four cycle window. It literally doesn't matter. And the load ports are completely independent from the store ports. It's like, this should be free. It seriously should be. Um, here, we can test it. Um, basically, we're just gonna do our inserts. Right? Here's our, uh, only on the right side we're doing inserts. Okay, 21.53 cycles. And then we're not gonna do those stores. And hopefully those are volatile enough for them to actually get created. <clears throat> so in theory, this could be two cycles faster. It's slower. <laughs> it's slower. It's slower. You what? <laughs> you what, mate? Yeah. I think it just, um, I don't know. Let's see. Let's see if it's consistent. 24. Put these back in. Let's go. Here we go.
Look at that. It's, fa it's faster. Whoa! It's literally faster. Take that, Desu. <laughs> Oh my god! <laughs> yeah, get fucked, Desu. <sighs> Didn't expect that result at all. I mean, I totally did. <laughs> now that's what I call optimization. <laughs> Just put two stores in there, duh! Um... <laughs> what the fuck? <laughs> it just must change the code shape a little bit. It That didn't make it faster. It affected the shape of the code and the shape of the caches, and it created things to be in a slightly different state. The, the act of adding two more writes didn't actually make it faster faster it just changed the way that lvm emit things and the assumptions it might make and the way things got inlined and it might have pushed something to a new cache line boundary and it might have changed the shape of something on a stack which makes the stack accesses faster all of these things matter right all of these things factor in um so you can't just say that made it faster but i am comfortable in saying i don't believe that this would change the performance um let's just do this how's this pgo i have no idea i i never do it i'm not a pgo kind of person um yeah even even inline never is faster or no <laughs> okay Okay, that is nuts. Uh, it's faster than the previous version without the rights. Um, oh, uh, it's <laughs> Demangolus. Okay, and uh, fast insert. Yeah, here's wow. It it it's not inlined. Holy shit! So this is the call. It's literally calling it now. Um, so here we read the pointer. Here we read the uh, number in use, and there's the two stores, right? Exactly as I said. Um. Oh, it's actually a multiply by eight, which makes sense because they are four byte things. So the, it still fits. Basically, two moves with immediates don't cause registers anything to happen. Like literally while this test is evaluating or other things, because this is a dependent, uh, this is a dependent comparison on a memory value. So this, this value will not be in RCX for four cycles. So this comparison, this well, this comparison and this branch cannot occur until four cycles in the future. These two just fire off, one cycle each, gone. So by the time that this even gets unblocked, these have already completed and they're gone. It just it just doesn't even matter. Um, okay. So, there's a lot of nuance in how processors work, and I'm glossing over a lot of the things that may or may not affect things like speculation, um, and whether that value is in a store buffer and can be uh, processed through store forwarding. Um, there's a lot of ways that things can get faster there. But anyways, now what we're going to do is we're going to read the left and the right, uh, we have to read both. There's no way that we can't read both. So we'll just unconditionally read both. Now what we're going to do is if left is greater than right, then we know that left needs to go up higher in the tree. And if the uh, left, so the left value we know is the larger one. And if the left value, which is a child, is greater than the value, then we need to store 
at the index, we want to store the left value, and then we want to update index to the left index. Otherwise, if the right is greater than left and the right is greater than the value, I'm going to assume the compiler can optimize that out um, to being a little bit simpler of an expression. Otherwise, uh, we have no place to propagate it. And we just break. Correct? If left, if left is the bigger one and left is bigger than the value, then we want to store left at, in this case, the root node. And then we update and we are going to descend into that child. Because that is now we, where we will store the actual value. Um, and then this, if right is greater than left, I'm hoping this will get optimized by the compiler because these are kind of inverse things. I guess they're not 100% inverse because uh, it's not equal to here. Um, but if left is greater than right, I guess it doesn't matter actually. Um, I'm gonna, I'm gonna do this. Right? So if left is the bigger value, then check. Is the bigger value of the two children larger than the value? If it is, then we need to store that at the parent to keep the data structure. Index is equal to left i. Otherwise, break. I don't like it. You think it's wrong or you don't like it? Um... But it's, it's correct, is it not? Mainly the, the reason I'm doing this is because um, this else should be cheaper than doing another if. So I had two ifs where I had a right greater than left, which would, re would require a new comparison to occur, I think. Um, oh, it wouldn't. It could use the old flags. Anyways, I, the code gen is likely the same because to the compiler, it's doing the exact same thing. Uh, if right is greater than value, then right. If left max, I don't know. So the problem is when I do the max, I have to also store the index of the maximum value, right? Right? The the I don't. What? I have to know which index. Oh, if left.max right is less than or equal to value. Oh, I see what you're saying. Um, yeah, I'm fine. I'm fine with that. that. That's what I was going to eventually turn it into. Well, not exactly that, but something where I use a maximum. Uh, max should be relatively cheap. It also is not... Um, I guess that's a conditional move, but that's pretty cheap. I trust the compiler to emit a conditional move higher for a max than for an if. Um, so say if left.max right is... Uh, I like doing this. Wait. If either of them are larger, then we're going to do a swap, right? If either of them are larger than our value, then we're going to do a swap. Otherwise, we're not going to. Now we need to figure out which one is. So say if left is greater than right, um, Yeah, if the larger of the two exceeds the size of our value. I think I'm more correct on this. Um, if left is greater than the right, then uh, we know that we're storing to the left. 
Yeah. Otherwise, we're storing to the right. Right? So if either of them are larger than the value, and this has handled the equal case. Basically, if neither of them are greater, then we just stop. Um, and this will prevent us. I think this is going to be faster just because of that e equality case. Even though we're generating random U32, so we're not really hitting the equality case. Uh, but in that situation, I think this is a little bit better because this will swat down if we're equal. Rather than doing multiple comparisons, this is just going to immediately say we're less than or equal to, bye, gone. So we have to be, uh, one of the children has to be larger, not equal, but larger than the value. And then we just care about which one was larger, and the compiler hopefully can borrow the conditional new flags that were used to calculate this max and also use them for here because it's the same flags, right? Um, this has to basically do a, a comparison, a compare left, right, and then it uses those flags to do a conditional move to do a max. And what it could potentially do is somehow store that flag, although it has to do another comparison. And since it's a flag architecture, it doesn't have a great way of storing that information to prevent another compare. That is probably cheaper to do another compare. But if left is the bigger one, then we put, uh, we store left at that index and we update our index to that and then write and then at the very end we write the value to data i think this is now correct come on come on come on fuck Really? But why? Is it that reading this memory is more expensive than doing a bound check? If left I is greater than or equal to self in use, right? So now we're going to prevent loads conditionally. I mean, it's, it's not a dependent access. Technically, a comparison might be cheaper than a dependent load compare. Yeah, okay. I was wrong. My fast algorithm idea sucked. It's just cheaper to check the bounds. But I do like this. I do like setting that min. Mmm, what? Is this just not stable? Like, this is moving by, like, 5%. <laughs> the stores. Those stores, man. Where are my stores? I need them back. The stores give me so much perf. <laughs> Just got to leave those stores in there. You can't get perf without a superfluous stores. <laughs> yeah. 
add more stores. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We'll just add, we'll add some more stores. There we go. This this will give us the perf edge. <laughs> Oh, it didn't give us more perf. I bet one one store is not enough. Maybe, maybe. One store actually is probably enough. Yeah, it's not a load. It's a store. One store is probably fine. Yeah, one store does the trick. Um... <laughs> yeah, so here, um, I've got a very wild theory, um, um, I don't know, uh, Seventy-seven one three, and here we go. <laughs> Writing a value to a global gets us how much of a perf speed up is that? Seventy-seven ninety-three. We got what, like a twenty percent speed up by writing to a global before we loop. Um, uh, what do we have here? There we go. That makes sense. Um, let's do our release. Relax shouldn't do anything. Okay, yeah. Um, I think on x86, that's not going to do anything. Um... And we're doing we're doing inline never as well here. Let's take a look. Um okay. That 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 all familiar. Uh we've got a knob for padding. This is pa this is basically padding such that the loop starts on a uh, aligned boundary. Um, compare the store, the one store, 
or the add, the, the direct store, the indirect store. What the fuck is that code, Jen? What is that code, Jen? What the fuck is that? The <laughs> optimizer had a stroke. Like, literally, it just wasted four bytes. It wasted four fucking bytes of instruction space. Why? My fucking JIT can optimize better than this. How can this not possibly get, like, fucking propped? That is unbelievably bad code generation. Are you fucking serious? It's literally four bytes just getting thrown in the trash. Don't get mad at LVM, Rust code gen sucks. Well, LVM is definitely responsible for creating these instructions and it should understand these instructions. Fuck! It's a double whammy. Not only is it a waste of three bytes by doing a move. This move is free. Uh, th this move is free to execute, but it requires... Uh, while the move is free to execute, um, having the extra bytes in the instruction pipeline do end up using up resources in the front end. But on top of that, a move R8 requires that you use a rex prefix such that you can access the top bank of registers. If it was an RDX here, it would actually be able to do an 8930 or like 8931 and it could skip the 4-1. So it's a four byte waste. All four of these bytes don't need to exist. <laughs> Son of a bitch. God damn it! Stop! I hate it. I hate it. I hate it so much. <laughs> uh. <laughs> Alright, sorry, coloring is pretty hard. Yeah, it, it is. Um, it's not... I don't think register coloring is NP complete. That being said, this is not necessarily register coloring. That's pretty bad. That's pretty bad. Like... And this is, this is inline never. So this, it's not like this function is large. This function can be fully optimized, right? There's nothing in this function. It, it's not like it's a massive function. There's no calls. There's no inlining. This function is so simple that it's, even if it's using like a lossy register scheduling algorithm that has better performance properties at compile time, uh, this should not be using it because it's too simple. It's just too simple of a it's too simple of a function to not get optimized there. <laughs> if only you switched to Jai instead of Rust. <gasps> Yikes. Fuck. That being said, that is not a noticeable performance change. 
Um, it, it will not affect the performance, right, uh, of this. So what we need to do is look if the code gen dramatically changes when we do a store to a global. The answer is no. It is a microarchitectural uh, effect that we're observing here. What I suspect is that this is causing a store to get flushed out that is currently, like, pending. Um... So here's the store. Um, so it loads those two things, and then we fire off a store. Oh my god. This is the same. There's still a NOP. This is a bigger NOP. Uh, but it doesn't matter. We're not hitting iCache issues. Everything's in iCache. Uh, this is still a loop that's aligned to a 16-byte boundary. And the it's exactly the same. All of the instructions are identical, right? So this is doing exactly the same thing. I know what is happening here. I don't. I don't know what's happening here, but I think I know what's happening. Unreal. Unfucking real. I mean, maybe not. Um, LVM still has bugs with no alias, yeah. But the code has not changed, right? The assembly has not changed, except for we now have a store, and that has slightly affected the size of this knob. Tell me there a way to snoop the store ports. Too bad that is impossible. You memeing? <laughs> Are you memeing? Because <laughs> there is. <laughs> Here's my hy uh, hypothesis. My hypothesis is that this store is causing the ordering to change, which is causing these values to be completed prior to moving to this comparison, which is causing this comparison to maybe be, or like even down to this comparison. I think this is improving our branch prediction because it is causing one of these loads, like maybe one of these stores or loads to thoroughly complete prior to the comparison occurring. Well, let's think about it. We've got a load happening here. A load happening this store might be causing this load to retire prior to comparing. Chat, everyone in chat, take a deep breath in. Everyone in chat, take a deep breath in. Deep breath out. How does that feel? You feel good? Feel, re feel relaxed? Feel happy? Feel comfortable? Get that chi flowing? <laughs> and let's fucking go. <laughs> let's fucking go, baby! Let it's time. It's time. Let's go. <laughs> uh, hmm. 
What's the syntax? Like a colon or an equals? It's like another equals or something like that. I just, uh, I just, where the f, I just put a block comment somewhere, rant, where, where did I stuff a block comment? Hello? <laughs> Hel Hello? Hello? Is it this? It was that. It was the DREF. It was the C it was the C plus plus comment plus the DREF. You got me. You got me. Um How does this work? Is it another equals or some shit? Oh, uh that. Okay. Uh move. Um This is gonna be uh, data. Oh, we can just pre-deref it, I guess. Yeah, let's let's do some pre-derefs. Uh, data is in register, which is gonna be self data as mute pointer. Just gonna do this. I think that looks a bit better. Okay, so what we should be able to do is we now have a pointer to data, so I can move into like racks uh, data. Okay, obviously, obviously this is not not right. It's clobbering a value. Luckily, Rax is volatile, so we're f we're fine. We're fine. Um. Okay, and then we'll just do. 100 iters. We just want it to get over with so we can see the uh, results of the uh, compilation. Okay, here we go. Oh, fuck off. Why? Why? Like I like I know there's a no stack attribute, right? But um, remember to mark Rax as clobbered. Yeah, it it doesn't matter, right? I'm curious why it's allocating room on the stack for nothing, right? It it knows that nothing's being used. Like, no stack just means that you don't use anything on the stack, but I don't understand why it would need to allocate room on the stack for nothing. Red zone? There's no calls. And we wouldn't uh, really be called from a red zone situation either. Let me see. can potentially use the stack. Yeah, but, um, like, yeah, it, it, it just assumes that it could be using the stack, but even then, why is it allocating them on the stack? It, it just, it doesn't make sense to me because, um, it didn't allocate enough room to get past the red zone, right?
Like, the red zone is significantly larger than 8 bytes, which is what it actually allocated. So I'm not 100% sure why it would have to push 8. Oh! Oh! Because it has to align the stack. That's why. It has to 16 byte align the stack. That's all it was doing. It needs to make sure that the stack is 16 byte aligned before your assembly. Bink, there it is. Thank you. We got there. We got there. And since we say we're not using the stack, it does not need to align it. And thus, the stack is actually unaligned in this function right now. Which is pretty cool. Cool. Okay. Um... So then, what we're gonna do is get the in use. Um, uh, in use. So you just read it. Um, how does sub eight align the stack anymore? It needs to be uh, sixteen byte aligned, and it. it Due to a call, there is basically the calling function has a 16 byte aligned stack. It then calls this function that pushes an 8 byte return address, which now means the stack is 8 byte aligned but not 16 byte aligned. In fact, it is guaranteed that it is not 16 byte aligned. <clears throat> The calling convention on pretty much all 64-bit architectures is to permanently keep the stack 16-byte aligned. <clears throat> and that that's effectively what it did. Um, if that makes sense, heroic. In use, yeah. So we're just going to implement this logic first, right? So we're just going to do a move um, index uh, deref in use. Right? Actually, what does no stack mean? It does not push any data onto the stack. Okay, but we can still read and write values on the stack. Yeah, that makes sense. I see, it's guaranteed to be eight bytes off a 16 byte line. Yep. Seems pretty wasteful as a calling convention. It's basically mandatory for uh, SSE, because otherwise you can't you can't store a, a 16 byte uh, SSE 128 bit register onto the stack. Uh, I mean, you can use an online SSE instruction, but you pay a massive penalty to do that. Okay. Uh, index is equal to an outreg. Dude, Rust inline assembly is so fucking good. It's so fucking good. It's so fucking good, dude. Oh, it's so fucking good. I can't get over how good it is. 6.27. Um... Beautiful. SSE on the stack? Yeah, I mean, like, most, uh, like, imagine you want to copy a structure on the stack. You're going to use uh, SSE instructions to do it. Aren't online SSE mostly free nowadays? Yeah. To be honest, kind of. Obviously, straddling a cache line sucks, but how do you know that you're not straddling a cache line when you're on the stack? You have no idea. You might be, right? So you have to still align. There's nothing stopping your, your stack from being perfectly cache split. Um, 
Okay, so we get the index. Uh, we're not going to write volatile, and we're going to do a naive loop. Um, okay. Then we're going to do a uh, test index index. Yeah, we'll do this outside. I do actually think this is better. Um, jump if the index is 0 to 3f. Um, and then this is 3f. So if the index is 0, then all we have to do is an add of in use with 1. We know that this is, uh, this is actually a quad word. And then we want to store into data. Uh, we want to store the, yeah, let's do this. Um, we're going to store the value in reg. Okay. And the compiler should know the sizing of that value, right? And then uh, we just return it out there. Oops. Okay. So we get the number of things in use. Um. Okay. Yeah, so, um, I forget how you do the sub-register. Is it just this, reg colon e, or something like that? Um, oh, uh, modifier. How do I do that? So do you know the right way to do it? After the colon in the curly braces. That? Does reg imply? I guess reg just implies 64-bit, um, maybe? I'm not 100% sure, because value is 32-bit here. Anyways. Um, we load in use here. Uh, we check if it is 0. If it is 0, then we jump down to... Uh, 8f, we don't have any other code. Um, where here we're going to add one to the in use, and then we're going to store the actual value, and then we're gonna return. Good, okay. So this is um, uh, empty, uh, empty case. Honestly, this might not be worth checking for. But we'll see. Okay, then what we're gonna do, at this point we know we're not empty. I guess we just move the index equals zero checked outside. So then uh, get the index of the parent. And to do this, we're gonna do, um, ooh, we're gonna maybe save off the old index, maybe as a pointer. Um, So what I can do is an LEA of um, into pointer of the data plus, which is a register, and then we can take the index, multiply it by eight. Sorry, not, not for this. Um, no, we just saved this uh, pi by four. So this will get a pointer, 
So this is um, get the pointer to the current index value. And that LEA is pretty cheap. And this is going to allow us to now in place um, subtract from the index one. This is uh, index is equal to index minus one over two. This is get the parent index. And then we're just gonna shift right uh, index by one, right? So subtract one, which is this, and then divide by two. So what we now do is we need to read the parents. So uh, read the parent value. Um, maybe this is not worth it. It's hard to say. Yeah, I think a move's gonna be cheaper here. Um, we'll just save the old index. Make a copy of the index. Um, and we'll call this uh, old index, OIDX. No, DEC, DEC is actually slower. Um, it takes up less space, uh, but deck, um, deck doesn't update all flags, which leaves some flags in a modified state, which can lead to a dependency issue on comparisons. Uh, that being said, uh, we'll see what flags we use, and that will determine whether or not it, it matters. Um... Okay, um, I had no idea. Yeah. Yeah, basically, uh, deck leaves a couple flags, uh, floating. It basically means that if you were to, like, populate the flags with a memory operation here, and then do a deck here, and then use flags down here, the flags uh, from this load have to complete, whereas if you use a sub, you guarantee that you overwrite all of the flags, and thus the even this load can still be pending if it's a non-dependent comparison. It's it's not necessarily super noticeable as a performance slowdown, but it it theoretically can be. Like you could make a test that would show it's bad. Um, but in reality, it, it often is not going to matter. Um, old index. Okay, so we just save that off. That's free. That's one instruction free. Then we're going to read the parent value. And to do this, we're going to load uh, into, I guess we haven't used temp yet, uh, data plus index times four. Then what we're going to do... Um, Compare temp e with the val e. Um, right, and that's what we're doing here. If the value, we'll go the other way. If the value is greater than the uh, parent value, and I think that's going to be a more common case. So we're going to just say is if jump not above, uh, which is basically inverting this operation, then we're going to go to uh, 4f. And we'll just say 4 here. Uh, we won't fill it in. And then this will be um, colon e means to use the uh, extended register, which is the 32-bit form. Because uh, it's a 32-bit data that we're accessing. That's what we're effectively saying here. Okay. If it's not above, then we go here, right? So if it's not above, in this case, if the value is larger than temp, right? We ins um, we're inserting it at the end. So we're basically popping it up. So then this is... Um, Swap the parent and or write in 
or this is going to be parent is lower, write it in. Then we're gonna do a move into the data plus, uh, this is the original index, which is the lower version. Um, times four, and we're gonna store the uh, the temporary value. This is the parent value. So the parent is lower, write it in. So this is the old index. The parent index has been updated here. And that's it, right? And then index is equal to parent. Index equal to parent has actually happened here. We've already applied that change. Um, so, now the question is how do we want to do this? So we need to basically loop. Um, four. If it's not above, go to four F. And this is um, done with the uh, uh, bubbling. Uh, write out the value at the index. Right. So the index has been updated. So at this point, it is. Uh, been updated to the parent, is that correct? No, that's not right. Um, make a copy of the index. If it's not above, then we are done with bubbling. Write out the value at the old index because we don't want to write to the parent. Basically, uh, here we save the index, we then compute the parent, we read the parent value, we check if we're bigger than the parent. If we are not above the parent, then we just need to store the value at the old index. So uh, this is going to be at the old index, store the value, um, and ret. Uh, we're not actually reading. Um, mm, yeah, I actually do want to ret. Otherwise, I need to jump past this. So basically, store the value to the old index. This is add one to there. Okay. Um, parent is lower, write it in. Uh, check if we're at the top. Hmm. Um, test the new index and the new index. If it is non-zero, go to two back. Otherwise, the index is now zero. Um... If it's non-zero, go there. And then this, we want to store at the parent index. I think this is right. Store the value at the index, which is the parent. And then jump 5F and get out. 
I think that's right. Ish. Let's do a couple more itters. Um. Get the in use. These are basically all the return paths. 27. I feel like that's definitely worse, but we'll see. Um, this should be worse. I don't like these jumps. Yeah, it's worse. Okay, sweet. Um, good, 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 good. Yeah, so load in use, that's what we're doing here. Technically, this ref is like more expensive to do that. We're using another register, which is probably causing us to spill. Um, we represent that structure, so we'll just say um, this pass in self here. And then here we can do uh, self plus eight is in use. Is only because we represent it. Okay. And self plus eight. Data no longer exists. Another scratch, move data self plus zero. So this is effectively what this is doing. So we, we load plus zero, that's data. We load the uh, index uh, from here. Test index index. If it's zero, go to some point in the future. Uh, one FAA, we're pretty much the same so far. This is going to store, uh, yeah, we store at data after. The ordering shouldn't really matter there, but we can, those are things we can fudge, but that's fine. Then, in this other situation, it aligns the loop, which we don't do, but that's not a huge deal yet. We'll see. We make a copy of the index, whereas this gets a pointer. Subtract uh, shift, we read the value, data plus RCX, which is what we just computed, which is this index. We compare that with temp. Uh, if it's not above, yeah, if it's above or equal, then we go to B3. And B3 is the, ah, it shares that return path. Okay, but yeah, if the value is not above the temporary, then we just leave it where it is and we go down here and we store it to the old index, which is what this is doing. So this is storing it to um, RDX. So RDX is what it will fill in here and that's the old index, yep. So that logic is correct and then we just increment that by one and jump to 5F. Unfortunately, we don't have a good way to return, right? And that's one of the issues with dealing with assembly is we don't, we can't really return out of this function because we don't know that we're in a function. Um, and that's where writing inline assembly can be slower. Otherwise, we moved the parent is lower, write it in. So the old index gets the parent value and let's see what happens here. RDX, the, the old index gets EAX, which is the value we just read. And then we check RCX, RCX. Um, if it's non-zero, then we go back. And if we don't, we fall through. And this one will write to the actual new index, R8.
Um. Fall through. If it is zero, oh. If index is zero, then yeah, it's fucking zero. Okay, I was about to say like, how does it know that? Uh, but that makes sense. And then add one and then red, okay. So uh, what we want to do is basically beat the performance of this. This is 25 cycles, 25.9 cycles. So let's see what we can do to make it faster. But I, I do think our implementation is correct. Uh, we've got some things that we have to deal with because it's fucking inline assembly. We can't read out like it could. So we have kind of a, a little bit less direct control flow here. 2357. What's the number to beat? Wait, 2592. Hmm. Um... Let's go down to here. Fast perf. RBH. Okay. Come on. Okay. Now we're only benchmarking this one. 2497. Why is that building it again? Okay. That's running plenty fast, so we'll up the iteration count, get some more averaging. Honestly, I might go to a deeper size. Yeah, let's go to a little bit deeper size and then cut down on iters such that we have a tighter inside loop here. And this should be a little bit slower, but that's fine. That's expected. I just want this to be stable. I don't like that 26 in there. Okay. Twenty five oh six, and then we're just gonna see if it reproduces relatively consistently. Okay, that looks great. Let's try it one more time. It looks very consistent. Yeah, yeah, looks fucking fantastic. Okay, so what we're going to do is we are going to align the loop. We're going to 16 byte align the loop. Slower. Consistently slower? Yes. Okay. If it's zero, go to three F. Oh, um, these two are the same, aren't they? Self plus eight, add. This can just go to 3F, right? You just store the value directly at data. If we're not at the top, go here. If it's not above, go to 4F. That slowed it down? 
Holy shit. Um... We don't want 3F here. 3F is just wrong. I'm just curious though. This should be even worse. Nope, that's the fastest one yet. Sick. Sick. Can we get rid of this? No, cause that. Oh, that's actually really hard. Um, I want to get rid of this, right? I want to get rid of this empty case check. Now that's going to cause an issue because we're going to be comparing against the parents. But if we're comparing against the parents, <sighs> okay, this is going to invalidate the structure, but I am a curious, uh, how much this speeds it up. Sick. Oh, okay, yeah, because that is going to go out of bounds. Um, yeah. Ah, uh, fuck. Yeah, I don't know if we have a better way. Um. Okay. Uh, since we have inline assembly, right? The compiler... The compiler, since we're doing inline assembly, the compiler is incapable of optimizing out this assembly. So what we can do is we can determine the cost of our uh, random number generator and our loop and all of those things. 2.62 instructions, 2.61, right? Since it cannot optimize this out, this allows us to kind of lower bound that. And let's get rid of the inline. So everything's commented out. Yeah, 1.68. Right, so that was the cost of the call and the ret and the random number being generated. So 1.68, so basically very little, like under two is the overhead. So I just wanna make sure we don't have 20 cycles of overhead plus five cycles. I wanna make sure we're not optimizing a tiny amount of stuff. We've got a lot here that we can optimize. 27, it's slower when it's not inlined. It's slower when it is in line, sorry. Sick. All right, let's try a store. Uh, we're gonna move into um, uh, global. We're gonna store, we're gonna store a big zero into uh, global. Uh, no mangle. All right, so we're gonna write zero into a global. Uh, let's do rel. Oh, um, they might do rip plus. Yeah. Is it faster? No. Uh, inline never. Okay, but I think might speed it up in that case. We'll see.
Still going? Hell yeah, we are. Hey, it slowed it down. Okay. Um. I'm, okay, so what we can do is we can just get rid of this right, right? Since we're working with assembly, and this is why I like working with assembly, we can just comment that out. We can see how much of our performance is this store, right? So what we can do is comment things out randomly and basically determine where our costs are. So we can see that this store is not a problem. Let's get rid of, uh, we can't get rid of that ad. We can get rid of this store. Let's get rid of all of these updates. Fuck it. We're just never gonna store a value. Ah, this might bias the data though. Yeah, cause this is now doing something different. Hmm, fuck. Yeah, hmm. Have you experimented with different heaps? No, I haven't. What? Oh, yeah. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, um, yeah, what can we really save here? We have to get the pointer to data. Have to get that. Aligning this hurt. Let's try an eight byte alignment. Yeah, it slows it down. Huh. That just feels so slow. And inlining it hurts it. I don't think you can beat the performance of a binary heap for what I'm trying to do. I don't think there is a better heap for it, to be honest. Pretty much the only reason people do something more complex than a binary heap is so that they can handle better performance on merging or you can uh, get the mins or the maxes and things like that that don't actually pertain to my problem. I just, I can't see how you could structure data in, a, in an easier way. Hmm. Beats a binary heap? Yeah, for n equals fucking massive. I highly doubt this would beat it for n40. Um... Min max heap, say it beats it. 
for even small ends. I'm kind of skeptical. Um... Hmm. Let's see. So they say... Like eight nanoseconds per push. And that's at like this log scale. Yeah, for small ends, it looks pretty much comparable. It seems to have better scaling properties, which is exactly what I would expect. But for a small n, it seems pretty much the same. Like, the average time to pop, it just, it doesn't really beat binary. It's just in the noise floor, uh, which then means it's really not worth the uh, implementation complexity. Have you considered a normal heat? Each node is a bucket. Yeah, we've talked about that. Um... I don't know. There's not a great... I, honestly, I just feel like this is... I feel like this... Uh, I feel like this is way too slow, this heap thing. All right, let's take a look. Our N is 1,000. Uh, log divided by 2 log 10 operations. 27.12... And that's worst case scenario, 2.72 cycles per. That just seems really expensive. How does this compare to standard heap? We don't really know. It's it's hard to say. Um, okay. Do do do. 27. It just feels so slow. I mean, we have so many compares. Most time it's lost misprojecting branches. Yeah, that's what I think. Um, let's try this. Oh, no, that has to be post indexed. Hmm, fuck, dude. I want to do something here. Um, wait a minute. Four F. Check this out. Um, hmm. Let 
Let's try, um... Um, C move above temp E. This is doing a max, right? Um, and we can RM that. Nice. So, uh, move temp move temp. We're not using temp, are we? No. Well, we're going to. Um, move temp the value. Okay. Uh, temp is equal to min um, val and parent val. Or sorry, max. Oh, we need to do a fucking comparison. Shit. Um, okay, then we, yeah. Uh, data plus index times four. Compare temp e with um, val e. Uh, we want it this way. If the value is above, then we want to move the value into there, right? So read the parent value into temp, then compare the value with temp. If the value's above temp, if it's greater than temp, unsigned greater than temp, then we want to move that into temp as well. Then we uh, store the data at the old index. Um, we want to go the other way, I think. Do you want to min? I mean, it, it depends where we want to store it. Um, so this is going to find the larger of the two, and we want to store the larger of the two higher up the tree. The index, IDX, is going to be higher up the tree. All right. So this will store it higher up in the tree. Check if we're at the top. If we're not at the top, then loop. If we are at the top, then we want to store the value itself. Um... Yeah, this is just store the largest value at the parent, right? So find the largest value and store that at the parent. And then keep going to the top. Uh, the old index, though. So this is wrong, and it's because we never store anything at the last index. And how do I want to do that? Um, do I want to do it here? Uh, 
store the value at the end of data, right? So index is, is the end, data plus index times four, we write that value in. We don't need old index anymore. Do we use four anymore? We don't. So we unconditionally store it at the end. Then we get the parent index. We then compare whether or not our value is bigger than the parent value. If it is, then we, uh, well, it doesn't matter. We're just going to store it. Um, right? Is that right? It's react one, shift right, get that value, compare. If it's above, store the value. Then we store that at the parent, which might just be storing the parent back to itself. That's faster. Bam. We finally made progress. Yeah, and I'm, I'm not surprised. Um, basically, uh, conditional moves can't, can't be speculated. Uh, so we basically don't, we removed a branch effectively is what we did there. Um, beautiful. Beautiful. We finally made progress, chat. If this is right, but I think it is, start at the end. This is basically unconditionally rewriting a value, right? We get the parent, we have our own, we jam it in where the parent is, and we might just be setting the parent to itself. If we're at the top, then... Here's what I'm thinking. I'm thinking about making this a, um, are you writing the parent to the child? No, that sounds important, but we're not doing it. Um, um, Okay. That's fine. I mean, I think we can do that. Um, don't need this. Okay. Um, right now, you never quit the search early. I do. Well, if we're at the top, um, but that's what I want. I actually don't want this top check to be honest. Like. The plan is to get rid of all early exits, in my opinion, and just loop unconditionally. And I think I can do that if I turn it into a one indexed heap. Um... I just want to see what the perf is here. It's invalid, but whatever. Um, I 
Nice. No effect on performance. Okay. That's what I want to see. Uh, let's just make a foo. Move foo e val e. Uh, this. Okay. Have you tried the splay tree heap? No, we're not using third party stuff. We don't really care about perf of other things. Hey! Hey! What? Bada bing, bada boom. Perf. The best part is we can vectorize this better. 22.5. Okay, is this, is this correct? We get the pointer to the data. Let's, um, let's do this so it can be cached better. When we inline, data is uh, self.data as pointer, uh, as mute pointer. Done. And then self, uh, self. This is gonna be um, in use. Um, yeah, shouldn't really affect anything. Dear if in use, remove plus eight, thank you. Ha! Perf, <laughs> big perf, yeah. Twenty two point four one. It's our best yet. Okay. Get the number of in use entries in the uh get the number of in use entries in the uh in the heap, right? If it is zero, if the number of entries are zero, then go down here. Increment the number of entries by one and store our value at the zeroth index of data. So just basically store it directly at offset zero and uh, increment the number of in-use things. Okay, that is correct. So let's see what happens if there are things in here. Then we will get, we will save the index. We'll basically make a copy of the current index and save it as the old index. Then we will get the parent. We will subtract one, we will shift right by one, and that is going to get the parent index. Yep. Then what we do is we read the parent value into memory, uh, from memory. So we take the new parent index, uh, we multiply that by four, and Oh, this isn't correct. Yeah, this isn't correct. Um, actually, we can make it correct. 
I think I can make it correct without actually changing the performance properties by just changing the, the way that we name things. So what we're going to do is um, temp is equal to uh, parent value, right? Then what we're going to do is uh, foo is equal to min val and parent val, right? And uh, we'll call that min. Yeah. So min uh, and temp, this is max. OK. Min is equal to value, right? So the minimum value is the value. The maximum is the parent. Uh, compare. Um, do I need to do that move? I don't know if I need to. We'll see. We'll see. Oh, yes. Wait. Mm. Maybe not sure. Good morning. Hey, Buff Seagull. Thank you so much for the one year support. Can we replace add adder one with add index one move adder index? Uh, it doesn't, it shouldn't really have a, well, I mean, yeah, I guess technically that could be an improvement. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, uh, remind me of that later. Um, we have the maximum value. We have the minimum value. We then um, compare the min and the max. And we don't know what they are yet. And that's why it's a little confusing. Um, but we should be able to write this in Rust, too. We're just doing it in an assembly for funsies. Um, this is a compare, uh, parent to, uh, current. Then we're going to smash these above max if, if the minimum value is above the maximum, then the min is the max. And then if the minimum value, oh, this is, is this right? I should be able to do this logic. I'm just not thinking through it. Um, maximum, max is parent. If the minimum is above the maximum, then the maximum should take the minimum value. The minimum value is this. If this is not above, is this right? I don't think this is right. Um, it's not right. I, I know, but I, I can do the logic unconditionally. I'm pretty sure. It's hard to think through because I have bad variable names. But this is the correct logic, right? The parent gets the max and the child gets the minimum. Um, not above min max, above max val. Uh, 
Um, is that right? I think we can do this logic without, like, moving things, or, like, without adding instructions. Like, I think we have the primitives we need here, and thus the performance shouldn't go down, right? Now, if we have the wrong result, then that might cause things to insert faster or slower than they should. You need a third register, and the third register is valid. But yeah, this is currently incorrect. Right now, this is incorrect, and that might actually be why this is fast. Um... Min and max is parents. Okay. So, compare min value with parents. Um, and then here we can say minimum is equal to um, if, we'll just write it out, if value is not above which is less than or equal to, right? Um, if the value is less than or equal to the parent, then it will be max, which is parent value. Right? Um, so let's think about it. Min, uh, the comparison is uh, min is value, max is parent. So value and parent. If the value is not above, which is less than or equal to, right? Um, then we will replace min with max. And max is currently the parent value, and thus parent value. Otherwise, it will stay the same, which was historically the value. And I think it's safe to say that that is wrong. Um, right? Um... Should be the opposite. I agree. So if we just say above, then that's the min. All right? If, if value is greater than, if it's above the parent, then the minimum will be copied from the parent value. Otherwise, it will be the value, right? So now we do the same thing here. If the value is greater than the parent, in this case, um, max is already the parent value. So the parent value is the else case. And this is that case. So it's actually two C move A's, right? Just due to the way C move A's work, it's the same comparison. The, the f old value is the parent. The current value in max is the parent value. So that's the else case. It's copied. The value is copied if it's greater. We cannot use min here because min is clobbered at this point. So then we store the maximum value into the parent, which is at index, which is the new index. We store the minimum value in the child, which is the old index. Now, what we need to do is we need to update the minimum, uh, we need to update the value with the um, max value. And this is update the uh, value to be the maximum, because we are unconditionally traversing the tree, right? Right. If we didn't update this value, then the next iteration, right? Then 
basically this assumes that the ma the current value that we're moving is in val. And it's still 2259. This is correct. I'm pretty sure this is now correct. Right? We go through, we update this value. So we go through the next time. So let's say, let's say we're inserting a five, right? And it is no longer the maximum value. Like let's say the five gets inserted into a child. We end up doing a bubble up. Um, we're always traversing the entire tree to the root, but avoid swapping. We avoid, a, we basically avoid a conditional. Right? We avoid basically the only place where a branch misprediction can occur, if that makes sense. This cannot be mispredicted because, like, this is uh, fucking easy to calculate, right? Index, actually, index never comes from memory, right? So the processor should never mispredict index because it, well, it comes from memory here, but, like, by the time it's being used, it can forward compute index to the top of the tree, right? Easily. Like, even if it's a massive data structure with millions of entries, it should be able to pre... It should be able to predict what that value is. Um... So right now we don't early exit, right? And that has given us a speed up, right? And I'm not super surprised about that, right? Um, that makes sense to me. Wow, that's some nice reproducibility. Um, honestly, the reproducibility probably goes up as the branch misprediction goes down because we have less random bullshit that affects the performance. Yeah, it looks like pff, really consistent now. Can this be done in pure Rust? Uh, yes, I, I, yes, I believe so. Um, now, what we want to do, I want to make an early exit, and I think I can. Maybe. Um, basically, if, if the value is no longer the maximum, then, uh, break out, right? Or if it, if it's equal, if the, or sorry, if the value is no longer the maximum, then, um, go to like, uh, I guess this exit here, right? We'll see how much this hurts perf. But due to these stores, hopefully these are like more predictable, but they should allow for early exits. Wow, and it's slow as shit. Awesome. So yeah, it allows for early exits, but early exits are more expensive because you, now you have a dependent branch on a hard to predict value in memory, right? And this makes sense as an exit. I think this is a valid early exit, right? If the value is no longer the max, then just get the fuck out. Cause at that point, we're just gonna replace the tree with the same entry over and over again, right? Like, so here's what I'm thinking. Um, compare those two. So the comparison shouldn't cost anything, right? That compare will still get emit, and this shouldn't affect the performance. I mean, technically, it's a slowdown, but it still should be like 22.5, maybe 23 flat, something like that, because the compare has a cost, but it's not being used. Oh, 24. Wow. Wow. 
Wow. Wow. Just doing the compare and not even using the results. Wow. Oh, try the other thing? Yeah, we'll do that too. Holy shit, so that comparison is expensive. Can we do any of this sooner? Can we space out any of this stuff? No. So here's what I was thinking, was do a conditional move if uh, not equal into um, index of zero, right? We don't have a zero, but we can make a zero really fast. But basically, cause this condition without adding an extra branch basically break this index to become zero to cause us to go to the exit condition which is a fall through right um so if we just said um does that make sense so basically <laughs> chain a conditional basically and a, a conditional together but unfortunately just doing that comparison is expensive so then here we can do um, ink in use. Oh, wait. Um, empty case. Jump zero, empty case, fall through. This has to jump over this right of the value to data. Unfortunately, we have to do that. So this should be super fast because in use is zero the whole time, never increments. Yeah. Um, so uh, I, I'm just going to do this. For now. Oh, baby. Um... Uh, let's just move max. Oh, sorry. Uh, let's do this. LEA max, um, index plus one. Move that. Right. So load a value, add one to it, store that to in use, right? Gets rid of one load. <laughs> I, yeah, I, it, and that might be noise. It's hard to say, actually, if it was faster to do an add and not have an additional instruction. It's hard to say if it is the same. These numbers do seem to reproduce pretty well. Uh, 0 0.6, 0 0.5. Um, Point four, and then we'll go back to this. Add, uh, we'll do, we'll do an ink uh, because we're overwriting all the flags here. So we'll increment this. Oh yeah, and we might do this afterwards. We'll see. We can probably get store forwarding if we move this down. Yeah, 2107. Yeah, I don't think that's a fluke. Now I'm going to move this after. This will get store forwarded. Basically, the store from this will be... It, this will read from the store buffer here. Oh, this is wrong, though. <laughs> it's just wrong. Sorry. Yeah, we need the old value. <laughs> um... In this case, we should be able to do a decrement because uh, we overwrite all the flags before we use any conditionals. 
and shift right. Yeah, it should be fine. This should be better. It, it, it doesn't really matter. So load the in use, increment in use. 21.1, let's go! Fucking clean. If the index is zero, just go to here and just write the value and then pop out. Otherwise, save off the index, find the parent. Assuming these are correct, find the min and the max, store the max in the parent, store the min in the child, update the value to be the maximum. Um, yep, because that is the one, because we are traversing into the parent, which is this, right? And then if index is non-zero, then go to 2B, otherwise go to 5F. I think this is correct, right? As long as this logic is correct, and I think we thought through that pretty thoroughly. 21 cycles. Let's fucking go. Let's put the old ones in. Um, I'm hoping these inserts and pushes are uh, valid. Yeah. In use of zero, clear, clear. So this will be on the left, our naive Rust implementation. In the middle, the actual Rust standard implementation. And on the right will be our assembly implementation. Yeah, we're the fastest. Not by that much. To 2BH, uh, but we are, yeah. Let's just see if it reproduces. Centerlib does a good job. It does now, it didn't before. Like, <laughs> it seems like there's an improvement to it made pretty recently in like uh, 1.49 Rust. Yeah. Um, we'll copy this down. Uh, S, uh, scoop from Polar. Um, we'll scoop out. Yeah, and it looks like these are behaving, uh, predictably, which is good. Yeah, it looks like we are consistently faster. Um, let's scoop from Polar, um, binary heap source main uh, to source main. Okay, so now we have the same code here on this computer, which has a different version of Rust. This is uh, 1.47, this is 1.51. Actually, this is 1.48, this is 1.51. Yeah, so our naive Rust implementation is faster than Rust's, and then our assembly version is faster than both. Nice. So the use case, if you're expecting a small n, that's what we're that's what we're trying to optimize for. But now we're gonna actually look, because we can do that. Let's hope this is stable. Look at it for a small n. Look at small N performance. Let's fucking go. Easy. That's what I'm fucking talking about. Whoo, baby. Let's increase. Uh, let's increase the number of iters. Let's let's make. Let's see. Maybe maybe there's some noise. Oh, we're crushing it. Get out of my house. Pizza signal! The pizza signal! Small N, let's fucking go! 
I knew it. I fucking knew it, dude. Fucking yeah! Let's go! Ho <laughs> ho! Yeah! And that's the fucking fast part! That's the fast part! That's the insertion! We haven't even gotten to the fucking slow ass min max! Yeah! Fucking huge! If we can get a fucking 3x on the inserts, I think we can get even more on this. And this is like 60 cycles, and this is like 20 cycles. Get out of my fucking zone, dude! Easy. What about a big chung- Oh, you want a- you want the big chungus? Uh, let's just do, a. Uh, we have some thick size numbers in here, so we'll just go to- Let's go to this. I don't know how many itters. Big chungus? I have no idea how long this will take. I'm assuming this is in the ballpark of computable. Uh, let's go to small chungus. Oh boy, let's just go all the way down. Let's just see. Uh-oh. Not too surprised. We're definitely small and biased. Yeah. Yeah, that makes sense. That's what I would expect. Um, we designed this algorithm with a, with a small n in mind, and that, that makes sense. Oh, do I want more iters? Um, let's do 10 iters. Are we faster at a thousand? I think we were. Yeah. You basically pay the full log in every time. Hell yeah. Yep. Yep. Yeah, I, I have to graph this. Uh, let me size is equal to one. Uh, while size is less than Now ours is not correct or safe or all of these different things um, But that's fine Um and then we have to average this out. Uh, let iters is equal to divided by size. Uh, we can go a bit bigger. Basically, dynamically, assume that there's a decent correlation, yeah. Beautiful. Beautiful. Yeah, and it looks like the threshold is, is right around that 1024 mark. But we are crushing at low end. Crushing it, dude. Honestly, that 10 is pretty good. So the end that I care about is like 40, so 32. Beautiful. Yeah, we scale worse, which makes sense. Keep in mind, we're inserting random data. Um, for me, personally, I am mainly inserting uh, forward biased values, right? So my values are typically, when I insert something, it is most likely going to actually be at the top or like second level of the heap. So we can simulate that uh, by basically saying, um, let's just do, uh, 
I, I. So this is not, this is inserting, this one will favor rusts a lot, right? This one will make mine look really bad because this is worst case. Uh, actually, this is best case for mine, sorry, because it's a max heap. Basically, we insert a bigger and bigger value with each one. Um, right? Yeah. Oh, interesting. Um, well, now I'm confused. In before I implemented like a, a min heap, not a max heap. <laughs> Um, so my, my rust heap and my assembly heap should have the exact same shape, right? Let's print the heap. Yeah, that's, that's what I'm going to do. Um... Uh, obh size uh, dot data, and then we have the uh, fast binary heap for size. And they should have the exact same shape, right? Oh boy. <sighs> yeah. Yeah, um, let's go back to randoms. Uh, the assertion with random will be a little bit stricter. Yeah, all the assertions are passing. Yeah, I think it's safe to say that they, it, it is performing correctly. Like, the odds that we insert that much random data and the heap is at the exact same shape, but it's also incorrect, fucking zero. Okay. So, let's just do this. Maybe, maybe I made a back favoring one. I don't think so. Is it rev or reverse? Rev. Sick. Uh, we have achieved the best perf. It's fucking instant. It happens on two. On two. Okay, why would it crash? I mean, we don't bounce check anything, so that's fair. Um, So what do we do? We insert a, a one followed by a zero. And that cra that that's a crash. Why would it not be a crash in the other way? <laughs> I'm confused why that wouldn't crash in the other case too. Uh 
Um, the store of EBX. Oh, I don't know what EBX. Oh, I don't know what any of these things are. Move test is this old index. What? What? Whoa! Um, what? What? Hello? Um, How? How? How is that possible? Is one of these not marked a clobber? Val. Val. Val isn't marked a clobber. Ah, oh, fuck. Um... We weren't overriding value before, but now we are. Uh, in use. Oh, that might invalidate our perf too. That should be the bug though. It's a... Uh, Okay. Okay. This makes sense. This should be worst case for me. We want to do the non rev. Remember, this is best case for these because they just do nothing. Oh, Jesus. Um, huh. Um, We slaughter on random. 
We fucking slaughter on random. That makes sense. Our performance should basically be the same, kind of regardless of what data that we have. Whereas other ones will get faster or they're, they're more data affected. I don't understand why the Rust one is so slow with random data. <gasps> oh, I know why. I know why. Oh, sick. Okay, then it all makes sense. Yeah, everything makes sense. Okay. Cool, we did it, we did it. Yeah, makes sense, okay. Yeah, yeah, it makes sense. Hell yeah, okay. Um, huh. Okay, so, um, it, I guess it really comes down to if our data looks more random. And I feel like our data is definitely random when we do our insertions. Random. I think, I think we win. Let's, uh, let's do some more iters, get better averaging. But yeah, I think ours is still better. Yeah, look at that. Um And then we finally get slower, but that's fine. Basically, we wrote a we wrote a heap implementation that is less susceptible to branch prediction. And when you have data that is hard to predict, e.g. not sorted data, we should perform better for smaller ends because we don't have mispredicts. And that is why these algorithms perform so much worse with random data compared to with sequential data. And descending is the same as increasing data when it comes to predictability. So effectively, these are very vulnerable to random data, which honestly, I would say almost all data is random. It's not random, but it's unpredictable, right? So basically, unless the insertions and unless the propagations, right? So if we think about it, when we have 
when we have ascending data, it can predict that it will always propagate it up. And if it always can propagate it up, then it does fewer stores than ours is doing because it just, the, the processor internally learns, okay, anytime we get to this instruction, uh, it's true and we just, we do our swaps all the way up, right? So it basically learns that it should swap every time and it is only doing one store each time and it's simpler and easier. And in the same case, in the descending way, the compiler just learn or the processor just learns for this branch, we never need to move a value up. We never have a true or false branch, doesn't matter. And thus it does the same thing every time. But when, the, when it's not the same thing every single time, um, mine performs significantly better, even though I do more work. On average, I do more work. I do like twice as much work um, per iteration. Just I do more stores, I do more conditional moves, I do more comparisons, like all of those things, but I do fewer branches. And that leads to this, not using branch predictors and thus not getting punished when it's wrong. And that's what happens with the random data. And that is basically my hypothesis. And uh, what we could do, um, let's try uh, II mod uh, 2. Let's try this. Um, I should have pretty bad performance here, but the other one should have bad performance. Oh, interesting. I guess it's just not enough different values, maybe. Even this will be predictable because it will frequently be doing the same thing on the next insertions. Yeah, I guess random's just the, the best example of that. True false is pretty easy, yeah. The, the question is, is most data predictable? And I think the answer is no. But yeah, that's exactly what's happening here. Ours basically always has the same performance. Regardless of the data that's being held, it has the same fucking performance. Whereas the other ones are susceptible to being biased depending on how predictable they are. But like, for our case, which is the like... For our case, which is maybe in the like... In the, in the probably 2 to 64 N range, it looks like we have a 3... 2 to 3 X improvement. Isn't most data monotonically increasing? Um, kind of? Um, like, it is, it's not necess, no. It's not monotonically increasing. And even then, it's like, it's really hard to determine how random the data would look, right? It's really hard to determine that. Um, um So, without being able to pop things from the data, it's hard to measure, right? Uh, because this requires that I pop things out. But what I can do... Uh, How much are we changing between these fights? 
I guess we go through all of the different spells. And that's it. Let's just say rank four renew. That's the best one, and we'll thus have probably the most action going on. And thus, hopefully, this is the most... If this works. Is there a reason why I need more in there? I don't know if there is. Uh, we'll just go this way. I can't remember if I need to have all of the spells. Oh, yeah, I think it's searching for one of the spells to exist. So we'll just say... Um, Schedule default. Okay, we create a new schedule. So at the end of this, we'll just say um, if do we bind spell or something? Yeah, if spell name is uh, renew rank five, and then we can print um, schedule dot scheduled <laughs> sick. Uh, let's just e-print that. So here's what the schedule looks like. And it's it's relatively monotonic. A lot of dupes. Um, yeah, lots of dupes, pretty monotonic. That being said, we're always popping the, the lowest thing off of here. But yeah, like there, there are some things that go out of order every once in a while. But yeah, I guess they are pretty much monotonically increases. A couple ones that are really weird, uh, but correct. Pain Rules, thank you so much for the party. Hell yeah. I just graduated uni for software engineering. I've been watching for the past 10 minutes and don't have a fucking clue what you're doing because I'm boned. Uh, we're working on a binary heap right now, but we've been working on this for a, a couple hours now that uh, we've kind of got a rhythm. We've got a lot of stuff. We're hopping between things. So it's not really indicative of the effort that goes in because we're, we're mainly looking at things that we did. Um, and when you look at things that you did, things seem... A lot crazier than than they actually are but yeah I guess mainly increasing with a fuck ton of dupes and I don't know the problem is we're always popping off the first thing so while they look monotonically increasing at any given time um it's a lot different of a picture, right? If that makes sense. Because we're, we insert them in this order, but we're always popping them off, so things get shuffled around more and more as time goes on. Kind of. Kind of. Have to say, I like the monitor wall? Hell yeah, we got the good monitor wall going here. Um, oh yeah, I can just paste that. Big. Don't worry about it. It's fine. Um, RBH, FBH. Fuck off. When did I get rid of that? Oh, that's on fucking gamey. Get rid of that. Um. This is good. We're good, just chilling. Um, okay. Okay. Uh, F 
FVH, RBH. Sequential accesses, they shouldn't be too expensive. Mm, fuck off. 371, push. Oh, oh, yeah, it's hard to say. That's really interesting. Um, yeah, fine. Um, Huh. But yeah, this data is largely sequential, which makes sense here. Um, which is why these are basically staying constant. If it's popping things off of the front, yeah, it's still mainly, I guess, largely sequential. I don't know. I, I think I need to pop things off to really see the difference. Let's try this. This is going to compare it with pops between our naive implementation. Um, oh, yeah, and we pop them out so we can't do that. Um, wow, our naive Rust implementation is crushing it. And then it starts to get worse. Yeah, that makes sense. Maybe. Uh, let's make sure we're popping. Let's make sure uh, OBH... Yeah, this definitely is pop. That, that's what we implemented at the start. Um, yeah. So when you factor in popping things out, our, our fucking naive Rust implementation is faster than the standard library implementation. And for n equals 64 or whatever, yeah. Yeah. Oh, that's inserting everything and then popping everything too. So that's not even accurate to how it actually works. Damn. All right, let's go back to Rand. And then once we get back to Rand, um, okay, now that we're at random again, and I want to comment out the pops. And what we want to do is basically see if we can write... Uh, I just want to see if I can write a Rust version of what we wrote in assembly. And we should be able to. It's really not that difficult. Um, okay. Uh, if index is zero, break. Uh, we'll just increment this right away. Well, after this. Um, then what we're going to do is um, min is equal to... Uh, let pval is equal to data offset parents as i size. And then we'll do min is equal to pval.min... Um, I guess doesn't matter. val.min pval. And then max is val.max pval, and then um, the parent will get the maximum value, and the index will get the minimum value. Uh, and then we need to update the value. 
and that's equal to max. And index is equal to the parent. Um, go to the next level, right? So that's the performance that we had in assembly. I'm just pasting it up here so I can see it. Um, I think this is what we wrote, isn't it? I would suspect the Rust version is probably going to be faster than our assembly version. Yeah, it looks faster. It's, it's, it's pretty much, you know, under the noise floor. So there's, there's no reason to have it in assembly effectively. Here's the old numbers. If I try to line them up, which is hard. Um, right. So 383, faster for that. Faster for that, faster for that, faster for that, faster on that one, faster on 32, 64, 128, 256, 512. Yeah, it looks like it's just faster across the board, which makes sense because we had to do some branches that uh, can be avoided when you actually understand the uh, performance of the uh, function, right? Uh, or when you understand the layout of the stack and stuff like that, right? Um, let's mark this inline never. And just take a look at the code gen here. Now, this performance is probably going to drop. We'll see. But, yeah. Yeah, performance has dropped. That is totally fine. Uh, but we can take a look now easily. At what the perf or what it generated, and yeah, it looks like it basically made the same thing, right? So we do our load, our load. Uh, here it stores plus one instead of doing the ink in place. There's the jump if uh, zero here. It pads it out. Um, another knob here, basically padding to get the 16 byte aligned. Um, it's going to update the parent index in place. It's going to read the value from the parent. It does a comparison. It then does a move and two C moves. It then stores two values. Uh, it then moves some values around, which is fine. It's just updating. We update in kind of a different order. This probably actually makes more sense. And then it does a comparison. If it's not equal, then it's going to go to A0, which is going to basically just ret. Um, no, that's the loop. If it is zero, it will fall through. Um, I guess it will store one more value. This. Oh, we don't need that anymore, do we? Yeah, I don't think we need this anymore, do we? Thank you, Jan Pollock. Thank you so much for the four months. Hell yeah. Uh, do we need this? Does this matter? No, it doesn't. Wait, no, yes. It's cool that it's basically the same instructions, yeah. Um, have you tried cargo asm for displaying code gen? I have not. So this doesn't need to be unconditional. If cell, uh, if index is zero, then data is this return, right? Uh, empty uh, case, just fill in the value at the root and return. Okay. Right. So this will slightly change the code generation, not too much. Um, we have to get that pointer, blah, 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 so on and so forth. While index is greater than zero. Yeah, well, now we can do it. While the index is greater than zero, get the parents, read the parents' value, find the minimum between the two, find the maximum between the two, 
store the maximum at the parent, store the minimum at the child, uh, and then set the value is equal to the maximum because we're going into the parent now and set the index to the parents. Yeah. Um, and now jump equal uh, C6. So C6 is just store and ret. Perfect. And then our loop here is our loop with our alignments. Subtract one, do the conditional stuff that we were doing. Um, then store the values, uh, update the temporary register, and then jump not equal on the test, and then the fall through is just a ret. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's pretty much what we would have done here. Uh, this is falling through to a ret, but we can't do a ret. Um, so yeah, the code gen is just strictly better, even though it's the same fucking thing, right? It's basically the exact same instructions. Um, and then here we go. And now we can inline it, and this will give us a better uh, idea. Obviously, we can go out of bounds here, right? Yeah. Yeah, perf is even better now. Look at that. Beautiful. Um... So if it is zero, data val, ret. Could add a condition for greater than 1,000, do slow path. Well, it's not, it's not on greater than 1,000. It's based on the shape of the input data. <laughs> it's based on whether or not it's predictable data, and we don't know. So min and max get overwritten. Value gets updated. Um, and val. Yep, I think this is correct. Let's assert these, make sure our assertions pass, but yeah. It's not an N issue, it is a, um, and we can, uh, we'll cut down on this just so we can blast through these real fast, try out all these different values, make sure we don't have any massive issue, yeah. If we, if we had an issue, it would show up with that, like if we had max here twice, this would immediately panic, right? Yeah. Okay, this basically asserts that it's the same shape, so I think it's safe to say that this is correct. Um, now the question is, how much does that performance actually matter? Um, I should be slower again. Cargo Asm shows the, uh, Assembly for a specific function. Oh, that's really nice. Let me make note of that. I'm not used to that. Um... How does, it work? How does this work if it got inlined? Does it force it to not get inlined or something? And what optimization level does it use? There's so many questions. Um, create fast inserts yeah that's what I expected <laughs> uh. The reason why Gamosa aids such tools. Yeah, pretty much every time we do shit like that, that's what we get. Sick. Um. I guess that. There we go. Okay, let's see. Maybe we don't need uh, no inline.
This is nice, though. This is really nice. Oh, rip. We do need to inline never. Um. So how does that work? Does it build it... Does it build it release? Does it use my cargo tommel? <coughs> um, and then we can do dash dash rust. Yeah, I don't know how it does this. Um, couldn't find a cargo tommel. So I'm guessing it builds it as release. But yeah, yeah, this is nice. I mean, honestly, the 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 mixing doesn't isn't super useful just because in a lot of cases it's just not, um, just due to things getting reordered. Uh, but this is actually really really fucking nice. I wish it cached it. Build type default release assembly style default Intel. Okay, so it uses my cargo dot It builds it as release. Fantastic. Um. Yeah, that's really nice. This is a, this is a big improvement. <laughs> I like this. This is good. How long has this existed? A long time. <laughs> a long time. Cool. That's slick. Thank you. I will probably forget about this. I want to say I won't, but I probably will. I don't want to forget about it, but I probably will. Like, I will use this if I get it on my... Um, I will use this if I get it as part of my, like, fucking workflow. Oh, maybe it does cache it. Okay. Um, yeah, and that looks fucking beautiful. Looks fucking beautiful. Um... Oh, inline never. Yep. Um. So yeah, good for random data. Let's see if let's see if the compiler can do something smarter than what I could do. Ah, uh, ah! Uh? This will just, I think, be better than across the board. Yeah, it should just be better across the board, even at high ends. Let's uh, cut this down. Champion. Fucking easy. Let's go. <laughs> I'm kind of surprised. Easy. Yeah, it's just better across the board there. No surprise once again. Fucking. I'm just an amazing fucking engineer. This is such a weird comparison. The code's so weird, man. The code's so weird. Try not random. Oh, yeah, we'll be fine not random now. Right? R right? Oh, God, if we're not, I'm going to be sad. I'm going to cry. Actually, it should be It should be worse, not random. Ah, fuck. Um, this should be worse, not random, just because uh, we do more. We store two values and... When we don't need to, it's kind of stupid, but whatever. Ooh, it's close. It's neck and neck. Oh, yeah, and then we start falling behind. Makes sense. Yeah. 
And that's just, we're just writing more values. That's fair. Um, if we basically, yeah, that's fair. Better for random data though, I'm happy about that. I mean, we're much better for low end random data if we don't have this, uh, that comparison. Um, okay, this in here. If index is greater than zero, ooh. Have you had some Earl Grey since it's morning now? I haven't. I haven't had Earl Grey in a while. What I learned today, Rust binary heap is pretty good. Well, we're only looking at insert performance, right? We're only looking at insert performance, right? And if we want to look at non-insert performance, which we don't have implemented in our fast binary heap, but our naive implementation, I thought it was faster, maybe not on random data, Huh, so Rust is better on random data. But what about on sequential? Didn't we see our our heap was better? The naive rust heap? I swear we saw the naive rust heap outperforming rust's internal heap. Mm, maybe not. Unless we broke it intentionally. I can't I can't remember if we if we broke it intentionally. Um hmm. I think that was on our actual supplied data. Which is interesting. Like when we had our data. Let's go back to big, big I, I, let's go to this, uh, whoops, okay, so now we have our real, oops, now we have our real data, and we insert big, and then we pop it all at the end. Yeah, um, for low ends, for low end, end values, um, the naive Rust implementation is faster. But not for sequential data, and not for random data, but for our specific data, it's like for n equals 32 to 64, which is probably what we're gonna be operating on, it's fucking faster, the naive version. It's so unbelievably data sensitive. Like, I, this, is, this is why like big O and all that shit doesn't matter, because at the end of the fucking day, well, it matters for big N, but when you're working with small N, literally the shape of the data large is like a much more overwhelming impact uh, to the performance. It's pretty crazy. It's like actually fucking nuts, man. Um. God damn. Oh, that's so annoying. Ah, oh, I've learned so much, but made no progress. <laughs> Yikes! It's pretty fucking standard here. The the, the, sta the standard Gamozo stream. Do a bunch of stuff, learn a bunch of things, but actually don't get anywhere. 
because uh, ultimately this is telling me that I really have no fucking say in the matter. <laughs> oh my god, dude. Oh, sick. It's disgusting. I hate it. Let's see if Pop Min works on this. I don't remember if we have Pop Min on that. Even though it's Pop Max. Yeah, it looks like we have it implemented. Oh, even even that's beating it. Oh no. Oh no. It does look like early exit would be faster here if we say and ridge val is equal to val. So if you get rid of early exit, 13, 23, 15 at 32. And now that 15.8 should become something better at 32. Okay, it, it did become better, but not much better. But it did become better. Um, okay. Uh, what if we unconditionally bubble down? Ooh, this is where unconditional is probably better. Because it either, depending on the shape of your data, either you're going to catch your mispredicts on bubble up or on bubble down. But it's going to be hard to not have mispredicts on either of them. Because one of them is going to, like, if your data is, if you're typically inserting new maximums, it's always going to bubble up. Which we'll get predict? I guess they'll get predicted well. In the back way, I guess I don't know. I uh, it's fuck. Uh, I don't know, man. I don't know how computers work anymore, to be honest. Let's implement our same algorithm. Um. Let's do n use minus equals one. Um. Let's rewrite it. Actually, due to the amount of comparisons here, we might do better. Let mute val is equal to... Um, so we have let ret is equal to data. And then we have data.offset self in use uh, as i size. So this is the um, uh, maximum value, even though we're calling it pop min, maximum value uh, from the start of the heap. And this is the uh, value at the end that we will put in its place. Then we're going to do a uh, loop while index is greater than zero let index is equal to self dot in uh oh jesus you got to go down on this one um what language is that this is rust so get in use offset i size um And use minus equals one unconditionally. We'll do. We'll go with it for now. For now, we're gonna unconditionally subtract it, but it, it we'll improve it. Cause we're always gonna have an entry before we pop in our tests, so it's fine. It's fine. It's fine. Unconditional that shit. It's fine. It's fine. It's fine. Okay, so we got the value, which is at the end. We got our index, which is where we're placing that value. Then what we want to do is... Hmm. We're just going to infinitely loop. Let left is equal to uh, index 
something plus one times two plus pl times two pl plus that uh, index times two plus one let right eye is equal to left eye plus one okay um okay let left is equal to uh, data offset lefty and right righty. Let min is equal to, uh, this sucks. Whoa. I actually don't know if I can express what I want to express in, um, without assembly. I want to use the same conditional comparison. Let's see. Uh, so, um, so, uh, I don't have a good way to do this. I don't know if I can do this without an if, man. You need an if, but it can be compiled to C moves. Yeah, that's what I'm concerned of. It's going to be harder for me to coerce it, right? But the the same, you can basically do a C move for the max, followed by a C move with the same conditional for the index, right? Isn't that weird? But you can basically do a like, you can basically do a compare. Uh, min max c move uh, above min max right and then uh, c move above min index max index right and that's what I, that's what i want it to do um let's try let's try our interesting design uh we'll just do Max is equal to if left greater than right. Yeah, I don't... Mm. It's not going to do it, man. It's not going to fucking do it. It's not gonna make it, dude. It's not gonna fucking do it. I'm gonna be pissed. Um, let's just put value in. Oh, let's just fucking jam that shit in there. Uh, just so we can look at the code. Fuck you. <sighs> it's just not, it's not going to have that, like... Thoughts of adding a channel point reward for running HDOP? That's interesting. I haven't done any rewards yet. I don't even know how to, what to do from. I mean, that's a, that's a strange one. Like, do I just put it up 
wants. Like, what? How long do I put up each top? And for what? It's it's not trivial. The fuck is this? What is, what is this syntax? Dward comma pointer comma? That's a weird fucking... That's a weird way to do that. <laughs> that's a scoff disassembler. Show the core count for the fans. It does compile to C moves? Yeah, maybe it's just because I looped it. Okay, okay. It's not... That's not terrible. So let's let's see. Let's see. Let's see. Let's let let us see. Um while ridge val is equal to val. <laughs> no, we want min, right? No, I actually, I, I don't think I need max because I'm descending, right? I'm pushing things down. Well, I'm figuring out which one's bigger, but let's see. Um, at the, um, um, at the max index, which is the the biggest child. I want to store a val dot max maxi uh, max right that's the unconditional implementation right it's not right but kind of Um, some red. Read the left and right data. It's going to be wrong, right? For various reasons. Um, that's one of them. Um... If left is greater than right, then left and left eye is the max. Right and right eye. Uh, oh, we also need to start, uh, yeah, we need to do this. Offset index is equal to val dot min max. Sorry, other way. There we go. So at the highest part, this is the parent, store the maximum. And at the child, at the maximum child, store the minimum value <laughs> between these two. And then descend, update value. Um, oh, value is going to be equal to this. Right? Oh, come on. Fuck off with the crashes. Um, this is correct, yeah. So let's see what it made. And then we just need to say this, uh, if in use right now it shouldn't crash anymore
fuck. Um, oh, it's going to continue descending uh, because we need to do this. Um, um, data offset right eye as eye size is equal to, uh, U32 min. Right, and this is what we were talking about before, to kill the uh, descending. And this shouldn't crash anymore. Fuck. <laughs> Fuck. Um, left and right. On each insertion. Zero, that's gonna find the left and the right. Insert left and right. Insert min. Yep. Um. Oh, if we have a zero, that's not going to work. Um. Uh, while the index is less than uh, self dead in use. Oh boy. Um. Noise. Uh, let's see what that compiled to. Uh, get in use, check, branch to a uh, ret. Um, otherwise. Uh, load. Already, I get the pointer. Um, subtract one and store the new value. EAX is set to one. Oh God, dude, this <laughs> this assembly output is really bad. This assembly output is really bad. Um, this is a fucking great tool, but holy shit, what is what fucking disassembler did they use? The fuck is this? This is so bad. Um movie the X uh R eight four index uh minus four. It looks like we Yeah, index is zero. Um it looks like it does one level of unrolling, but we do have all C moves. But we still basically have a, a dependency here that makes that conditional. Like, yeah, and that's just gonna be worse. Cause this, this is an expensive conditional. Yeah, and, and we're just worse across the board, which, which totally makes sense, right? I would not expect this to be good at all in, in any situation, but it is a take. Um, this one's so interesting. I love that. This is just so cute. Like, the fact that this works better for random data is just so fucking funny. Um, well, the index is less than in use.
And I think this is wrong, actually. Uh, good morning, gorgeous. Hey, how's it going? Data offset in use. Oh, if we just pop, that's fine. We just update the length, that becomes zero. So while the index is less than that, blah, blah, blah. We read ahead. Once again, we're operating on values that are out of bounds, but that's fine. And then take the min. And then max i is index. We descend into the, yeah, I, like actually this is correct. Um, it's just slow as shit, which is uh, kind of expected. It ain't great. <laughs> and yeah, it, it's gonna just always fall behind. Oh, what data are we using? Let's do, um, let's do random data. Come on, this is our time to shine. Random data, please. Plicks, plocks, random data, big pog. This is where we can we can pull ahead, get a W. Nice compile time. <laughs> nice build time. Rust, explain yourself. Holy shit, Rust. Rust, hello, hello in there. Hello, is there still a compiler in there? Hello. <laughs> <laughs> Hello? <laughs> it's doing its best. It's working hard. <laughs> oh, this is good. This is good. This is good. I see. Everything is fine. Hmm. <laughs> Um, hello? <laughs> Did we break it? Did we break the compiler? <laughs> oh, we did it! Let's see if it's, uh, it's probably LTO. I wonder if it's just, like, infinitely unrolling. Oops, um... Oh boy, <laughs> what about a debug build? Okay, debug builds work, but not a release build. <laughs> what? <laughs> we fucked the optimizer. We did it. <laughs> we did it. <laughs> Hello? <laughs> um, op level one? Oh boy! Oh no! What about like a, what about like a Z? Uh, quote, um... Oh no! Oh boy! Op level zero? Is it, it's optimization related. It's optimization related. We did it! <laughs> we broke the optimizer! <laughs> All right. Is it LVM or Rust? <laughs> Who knows? Memory usage is not climbing. It's just, it's just chilling. Uh, do you think it's only this version? Think it's only nightly? Um,
It repros on a whole different version of Rust on a whole different computer. Hey, it did it! It did it! In one minute and 18 sec- <laughs> Whoa! What? 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 Whoa! Whoa! What is that code, Jen? Oh boy, oh boy, we gotta go to op level three and fat that shit. Let's go. Oh boy. Oh, we've got some catastrophic optimization problems coming in hot. It exploded. <laughs> Brewflot, thank you so much for the two months of support. Hell yeah. <laughs> What's going on? We have no idea. We think we broke the compiler. <laughs> Oh, man! I mean, maybe it's just slow because of opt level one. Maybe. Maybe it's just the opt level. <laughs> uh... Yeah, we're building released op level three, LTO fat, debug true. <laughs> Let's see. Let's see. Come on, Rust, you got this. <laughs> oh man. <laughs> oh, that's a doozy. Oh yeah, I haven't checked the stonks. How are the stonks doing? Oh, Jimmy's going down. Fucking rip. Time to buy the dip. Buy buy the fucking dip. <laughs> oh boy. <laughs> What is it doing? <laughs> it's been two minutes. <laughs> oh man. <laughs> the question is is the perf going to be that bad? I think that's just due to op level 1, but wh what? <laughs> oh, we had inline never on that too. It's <laughs> Prediction started. <laughs> Win channel points, hell yeah! What's the prediction? <laughs> Will it compile in five minutes? Oh no. Uh. It's so close. It's so close. Ooh, we got some yeses, some noes. There's a lot of points up for grab. A lot of points up for grab. <laughs> Ooh, someone put a big bet on yes. Oh no. We're at four minutes. Four minutes. <laughs> People have so many fucking channel points in here. Oh no, 45 seconds! <laughs> oh! Oh, big payouts! <laughs> big payouts! <laughs> oh, we're faster! We're faster! Woo! Four minutes and 20.
21 seconds. Just lost 15k. Fucking rip. <laughs> oh no. Wow. Four minutes, 21 seconds. <laughs> oh man. <laughs> Look at that! We're faster! We're faster than Rust version for the end that we care about! For random data! <laughs> oh, and that's inline never! Oh, no! I. That's not a fair test because it's inline never! Alright, let's take a look at this code gen. Let's take a look at this code gen in here. It's honestly not too massive. Like, this looks reasonable. Oh boy. It, oh, this is main. Oh, is this still main? No, that's not main. Um, where's the last RDTSC? Yeah. <laughs> what is it doing? No cargo asm. I can't. I can't for this. It would take another five minutes. <laughs> what the fuck? Is it, is it, uh, let's try it, let's try and inline it. What the fuck? Like, is it trying to predict the random? Is it trying to like, unroll that random? Like super fucking deep? Like, it, it's... Okay, let's see if it's OBH. OBH is not affected. What about FBH? Dude, there's something going on in their hash table implementation. It, it's probably some generic explosion. Yeah. It's something with this. But why would the other code affect it? All right, so we'll just comment out this. We'll comment out that. Does that does that fix it? By commenting out something that's unrelated to it, does that fix it? Is it having this array exist? That ar <laughs> So if that array exists and you use random numbers, it just it's just gone. <laughs> yeah, it must be it must be reevaluating this function uh, many many times and it like reparses that or some shit. It's funny because when you use the array it's fine, but when you use random and don't use the array and the array is effectively unused then it's not fine. Totally unreferenced array fucks it up. Oh, look at that. Look at that perf. We crushed it. Look at that. Look at this low N. Oh man. Oh, we are we are some good developers. <laughs> it's pretty fucking good. 
Nice! We did it! We fucking did it! Um... For random data, it's faster. Dude, it, it is it is seriously getting to the point where you literally cannot optimize code anymore because processors are so fucking random in how they behave that you can't fucking optimize code. Like, literally using a completely different algorithm for using a... a like, this algorithm is fucking scuffed, right? No one's gonna fucking write this. This is an absolutely ridiculous way to implement a binary heap, but it's fucking faster with random data by a significant margin, right? Like... Here we go, different PC. And we fucking slaughter, we slaughter. Have you tested if it's actually correct? Yeah, it's, it's fine. There's some like out of bounds accesses and stuff and crashes and stuff, but it's fine. It's fine. Like, technically, the only thing I need to do to make this entire thing correct is I need to put one bounds check here to make sure right eye and left eye are in bounds. And if right eye and left eye are in bounds, then everything else is in bounds for the rest of this. And, th and that costs nothing. Um,. Keep in mind, this is on the older version of Rust, right? This is on the 1.47 before they had the improvements. So it's hard to say if it's due to a different UARC or different to those performance changes, but um, it does look like the scaling properties have gotten significantly better. 2048, yeah. I think, honestly, I think they made a really big improvement to the binary heap in Rust. <laughs> And the, the one that I used, the one that I tested against, fucking sucks. Um, but it's, it's pretty hard to say unless I were to uh, get that version on here. And that's just kind of a pain in the ass because I'd have to, uh, I'd basically have to subvert um, emerge, which I don't want to do. But like I can, right? Um, test on playground. I don't know if, I don't know if they, I don't know if I can. I, I don't really trust doing a benchmark on here, to be honest. Faster for the uh, Rust version. Oh, uh, yeah, dude, these numbers are random. Uh, yeah, these numbers are random. You can't do a benchmark on here. You're just not getting scheduled. Yeah. Nope. Um, uh, 
Oh, 1.49 is stable. Oh, that's fucking y yesterday. This is the one that has the improvement. <laughs> Literally, this is the one that has the fucking improvement. Um... Um... How do you how do you select it? You can do like plus tool chain, and then can you do cargo? How how does it work? I mean, I can set the default, right? That's easy, but it's not necessarily what I want to do. But we'll just do it. <sighs> and we can probably fit this on the stack. It might crash, but we'll see. Yeah, it's fine. Faster. And this is of like the latest version or faster for random data until until a point where we cross, which is fine. We expected a cross. Cargo plus stable. That's the one that I wanted. Um. Uh, tool chain. Install stable. Uh, uh, 1.49. Uh, let's see. Yeah, I'm on 1.48 nightly. I don't know specifically what, what, uh, version. Um, yeah, I want like a verbose version. Oh, there we go. Hmm. 1.48 nightly, but whatever. Cargo uh, plus 1.48. Oops. Wow, dude! They made a massive improvement to binary heaps. Holy fuck! Yeah, 1.49. Added that. Yeah, we were faster almost all the way across the board. Wow, look at that change. What a big fucking improvement. Not too much around the end that I care about. 64. I honestly like a 30% speed. It's like a 30-40% speed up across the board, which is pretty fucking good. I'm still yeah, I'm beating both versions, which is fine. Uh Yeah. And then this is full nightly. I don't think they made any changes. It was just that one change in 49 which came out yesterday, which means I'll be getting that pretty soon here. Um, it, 
It'll probably be added to the Gentry repo today. How does it compare to sorted vector for small n? We can see. Yeah, no rust yet. Probably tomorrow is that update. Um, um, Uh, I guess I want to just do, yeah. Um, yeah. Um, that might get optimized. Yeah. Um... Can you pop instead? I can't. I guess sort... Um... Uh, well, let's, um, and then, uh, reverse. How the fuck do you do that? This? Ooh. Oh, you can't do that. It, it's close enough. You also need to store reversed, yeah. Because this is going to pop off the lowest 
Or actually, this is popping off the max. This is actually correct. This is popping the max. But yeah, it's worse. And that makes sense. There's a bunch of vec resizes and stuff going on here. Um, well, I guess there's not vec resizes, but there's a bunch of bounce checks happening and a bunch of fucking copies. A bunch of fucking copies. Right, so if we had val is equal to ii, and we're just inserting sequentially, this should be faster, right? Across the board, it should just be faster. Yeah, and it is, and that makes sense, right? Once again, uh, sensitive to the the data inputs. Um, honestly, I actually don't know why that would not scale linearly. Oh, because it's doing a binary search, right? That makes sense. It's still doing a binary search. So th we're still seeing a, a log n here. But yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, I wouldn't I wouldn't expect that to be faster. Um, oh, we're also not using the exact same rand, but it's fine. It's not a big deal. It's fine. It's fine. I don't think it matters that much. I mean, it, it does, but it, it doesn't, you know? Picking up what I'm putting down. Um, yeah, so ours is better for random data, which is reasonable. I guess that's what we kind of designed it for. Um, but our data is probably not random, so it's probably not very good. Uh, ultimately, the, the Rust implementation of binary heaps uh, seems like it was pretty bad until recently. So... Basically, they got a they got a massive improvement to performance on the binary heaps recently, and that probably just makes it best to just use theirs. Um, yeah, technically we edge them out here, but obviously for any other shape of data that's not random and doesn't have prediction issues, uh, we're just gonna get 